Good morning. My name is Alan Weil. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're really thrilled to be able to be here and to have so many of you here to discuss uh, the critical topic of oral health and particularly to put it in the context of the many issues you are uh, discussing and confronting in California. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, setting the stage, uh, then turn it over to uh, representatives of the two organizations that made this briefing possible, the California Wellness Foundation and the Gary and Mary West Foundation, and then we'll move into two panels. Um, for those of you who are not uh, closely familiar with health affairs, we're the leading health policy journal in the United States. We publish monthly, and about half of our issues are uh, thematic. And in December of 2016, we published uh, an issue on oral health. It was our first uh, dedicated issue on oral health, and it was really a, a pleasure for us to have the opportunity to do that. Um, when you when you uh, when you lead a journal, there's sort of the question of so so what now? What next? Uh, we're not an advocacy organization. And often we think about uh, what the literature does is document problems. It's, here's, an, here's an article that says, here's a problem, here's another problem, here's another problem. And uh, the question is, how do we contribute to solutions, which of course is what we're all trying to do. And as I think about uh, what we did in this issue and what we try to do in others, documenting uh, sounds like a very, uh, to me, a very passive way of thinking about the role we play. What we're, what we're doing is analyzing problems. And that analysis of, of the authors, of course, uh, helps us understand uh, how we got where we are, which is something we'll be talking about somewhat today, uh, what the weaknesses and the strengths are in the system so that we can uh, try to figure out what to overcome, figure out what to build upon, and uh, to uh, guide us in where we ought to put our energy and focus. Um, I was, uh, I'm, I'm actually a Californian, and so I was with some fa family members yesterday after I flew in, and we were talking about uh, uh, dental coverage in California, and I said, you know, one of the blessings and the curses of of uh, or of of thinking about dental coverage in California is that you've had the the uh, experience of providing adult coverage, taking it away, providing it, and uh, for for a researcher that's wonderful. If you're a uh, recipient of Medi-Cal, it's not so, or Dentical, it's not so great. But if you're a researcher, you have this sort of natural experiment that, that helps you understand the implications of policy change. And uh, so uh, what researchers are able to do is to take advantage of situations like that to help us understand the implications of, of important uh, decisions, including uh, coverage. But part of what I like about the issue is we didn't just talk about coverage as critical as it is, but we also talked a lot about the delivery of care the personnel uh, needs to uh, achieve access, the licensing issues. And so uh, one of the joys at Health Affairs is that we can bring together uh, not just sort of the, the quantitative analyses of, of coverage and cost, but also uh, the critical issues of access and uh, provider availability. Um, when we publish an issue, we pay a lot of attention to how it's used within the first few weeks. There's sort of press hits as the uh, findings come out. We had a big event in Washington, D.C. when the issue was released uh, at the end of last year. Um, but just this last weekend, there was a big story in the Washington Post uh, that uh, talked about the incredible uh, uh, limitations of access that so many uh, low-income people in the Washington, D.C. region have, how people will, you know, travel for a day and wait for a day or two to go to a free uh, clinic, uh, and how, uh, how desperate, really, uh, people are uh, to get uh, their pain treated and the care that they uh, need. And, I, and, and Marco just told me that there was a piece in the Chicago Tribune uh, that actually cited some of the work from the health affairs issue. Um, I was traveling yesterday, so I didn't see it. But the point is, when we, um, when we publish these articles, they don't just enter sort of the, uh, the news cycle of the week or the day. Uh, they, uh, they stay in the literature and they're called upon by academics as well as by uh, the media over time to uh, document and understand the problem. So it's a pleasure for us to take this issue that, uh, that we discussed in Washington and bring it here to you in California. When we have a release event, we go through sort of paper by paper. Uh, for an event 
moment like this, we're doing some combination. So you'll hear some from authors uh, about the findings of their research, and you'll hear some from people who are working on the ground, whether it's delivering care or helping uh, organize the, the care system, uh, all of which I uh, hope will uh, be uh, educational for you. So uh, with uh, no further ado, let me turn it uh, first uh, for some brief remarks um, from the, as I say, the two uh, sponsors of this event. Um, I'm going to fir uh, turn first uh, to Judy Belk, who's the President and CEO of the California Wellness Foundation. Uh, the foundation has a mission to improve the health of the people of California. Before coming to California Wellness, she was a senior vice president at Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors and Oh, I'll, I'll just do one more. Uh, Vice President of Global <laughs> Public Affairs at Levi Strauss, and I'll let you say the rest of it. But please join me in thanking uh, Judy Elk for being here and her. Thanks, Alan. We are delighted um, to be um, co-sponsoring this event and really delighted to be a partner with you. Uh, I bring you greetings from both the board and um, the staff of the California Wellness Foundation. I understand there are about 40 folks listening or participating uh, on webcast. Is that correct? Somewhere? They're out there Someone in knows. there? They're out there. Um, so I bring you greetings. Um, and I think uh, the fact that, you know, I've talked to folks who've flown um, cross country in addition to Alan and others, um, that it's really a testament to um, the increased kind of awareness of this. I was thinking a lot about this as I was flossing last night and this <laughs> morning. I thought everybody was going to be focused on the smile or whatever. Um, how important it is in a variety of different ways. Um, I want to first um, extend a welcome to Dr. Jay Kumar. Dr. Kumar, where are you? Please stand. Um, <laughs> Uh, he is California's um, relatively new uh, state dental director. Uh, it's great to finally have you here. We have no shame that we stole you from New York. Um, but um, we are really looking forward to working with you and your leadership. Um, this is a big year for Cal Wellness. Uh, we're celebrating our uh, 25th uh, year. And our focus has always been looking at health and wellness in a broad uh, sense of health and wellness for the most underserved in California. Um, so given that, throughout our history, we've always uh, funded um, in oral health. But in 1992, based on research and what we heard from many uh, in this room and from actually folks on the ground, beneficiaries of our grants, um, we, be, we heard a lot more about uh, the challenges and the gaps in oral health. So in 1992, uh, or in uh, 2005, we decided to really elevate oral health as one of our primary uh, areas of uh, focus. And we couldn't have found a better team to drive that effort. Uh, Program Director Jeff Kim. Jeff, where are you? Um, <laughs> and our, our program assistant, Lori Green. Um, so, uh, you know, Jeff has just taken off with the support, again, of many in this room, and we have a strong cohort of about 12 uh, grantees working uh, in this area, many who are in the room. Um, we, when we heard that Health Affairs made the decision to dedicate it in an edition of the journal, and I like a great story, and I have to say, um, last night I turned off CNN and I uh, read some of um, the articles again. Is Beth Mertz here? Uh, Beth, your history of uh, the field of oral health, especially as, as how we got to this point and why so many uh, low-income individuals throughout California and around the country um, do not health, have health care. It is really great reading around uh, oral health. So it's a, I love a great story, and it's a great story, fascinating of the field. So um, I want you to sign my copy, if you don't <laughs> mind. Um, you were great. Um, 
Uh, the other thing is that there has been some progress, but there's been, as you know, some missed opportunities on the policy front. Uh, the Affordable Care Act did not mandate dental care for adults as an essential health benefit, although it does so for children. Neither does Medicaid. And while California has opted for Medi-Cal to extend uh, dental benefits to low-income adults, that coverage is incomplete and can be suspended at any time. And Medicare does not cover oral health, leaving seniors to scramble. And, you know, this is, we talk about this in the policy front, but over the weekend, um, I was with uh, some friends, and they asked me, you know, what I did. I hadn't met uh, a group. And when I told them that, you know, I would be coming to an oral health conference, um, they said, you know, do whatever you can to deal with this issue. We are taking care of our elderly parent, and when we're, we're scrambling to try to get her oral health. And she finally said, you know, I think I, we ought to focus on the cataracts because we can't do both. Uh, the fact that folks all over this country and this state are making those choices, uh, hopefully the work that we're doing um, today will help make um, those um, choices um, less difficult. Um, I'd also uh, like to say that we have partners in this work. One of the hopes that we had was that we would have other funders joining us. I'm really glad that Pew is here, uh, that's been a leader in the work. But here in California, we've been really pleased um, to be a partner with the Gary and Mary West Foundation. And if you don't know about this foundation, you know, Tim will share, but check out their website. Uh, we've been also so just honored to join them in supporting um, an amazing oral health clinic in um, San Diego. Uh, we can't do this alone. We thank you for coming out uh, for your support. We want to thank you on behalf of the Cal Wellness for all that you've done in advancing wellness throughout California. So I'll turn it over now to Tim. If we don't address oral health care in America, it's very clear we cannot address successful aging. Yet the issue remains largely unaddressed and certainly underaddressed. In a recent survey that I was reviewing um, in preparation for this meeting, a third of seniors report being in fair or poor health, which there, there, there's lots of ways you can characterize the health of the senior population, but this reflects how they feel and whether we're able to deliver the things that matter to them. One third, fair or poor. On a trajectory to 50% by 2030. Successful aging for that population requires not only being deliberate in achieving the medical outcomes, but being as deliberate on achieving outcomes related to their overall health and their overall well-being. Oral health care is critical to those outcomes. No doubt some progress has been made. California is very fortunate that we're one of 29 states that has limited oral health care coverage for older adults. But make no mistake, obstacles remain. Cost, coverage, overall oral health care, education, all things that must be addressed. If you look at the demographic trends, and I'll spare the details because there's many ways that you can, you can look at what's the phenomenon that's really unprecedented and historic that's happening across the country. But today, one out of the 50 states has a senior population at 20%. That's the world we live in. By 2030, 40 of the 50 states will have senior population approaching that same level. It's a good thing, but we have to prepare for it. We must prepare for it. 
And I think we have to prepare specifically around the oral health care needs of that population. I'm Tim Lash, Chief Strategy Officer from West Health, and our mission at West Health is to ensure that seniors can age in place with access to high quality, affordable health care and support services that protect their dignity, quality of life, and independence. We do that through applied medical research, policy research, and philanthropy. We don't have all of the answers, but I'm hopeful that together, in meetings like this, we can start to ask the right questions and start helping seniors connect, connect their mouth to their body. It was, it was a real privilege that through the Gary Mary West Foundation, we were able to provide support to health affairs First, we heard the first issue focused on the state of oral health care. It was an excellent issue. West Health is also taking action. One year ago, we launched the Gary and Mary West Dental Center, located in a senior center, novel, in downtown San Diego. Over the past year, over 2,500 visits have occurred, yielding not only seniors in San Diego who are in less pain, have greater confidence, overall improved health status, but also new insight. Every senior that comes through the Gary and Mary West Dental Center receives a comprehensive geriatric assessment, a CGA. I spoke about being deliberate around the medical outcomes, but also achieving the broader health and overall being. Well, understanding the broader context and the needs of a senior not only their medical needs, but what matters to them is absolutely critical. 80% of the seniors that present to the dental center have more than three chronic conditions. And the insight from the CGA allows us not only to target the most appropriate dental treatments, but also start to address and coordinate services that address their broader social context, address nutrition, and other vulnerabilities that exist. When I think about meetings like this, there's many things that can occur, but it is an absolute imperative that we start to ask the right questions. When I, when I think about the journey ahead of us, there's choices that are going to have to be made. Trade-offs from a policy perspective, trade-offs from a practice perspective. And I think too often when we make choices, we base them on what we've done before. Or worse, we base them on what someone told us to do, whether or not that's informed or not. And I just wonder how much better we'd be off if we start to make informed choices. And I think the insight that comes from these meetings and these panels really start to enable that. We're here alongside of all of you because we see an opportunity to further connect the mouth and the body, to connect oral health care with general health, to emphasize prevention and education, and to evolve policy, and to do that in an informed way. How is it really today? Where do we want to be? What are the gaps? I'm looking forward to a great session, and I want to invite Alan Weil back up to introduce today's first panel. Why don't you all make your way up. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, Tim. I'm sorry I didn't give the, your formal introduction, but you did yourself, and I appreciate it. So uh, let's uh, get started with the program. Exactly with uh, Tim's guidance, this is an opportunity to dive in. Uh, these are authors of papers in the issue. Um, oh, Anthony is here. I was going to say, I know he's like triple tasking today, as usual, but I'm um, glad you're, uh, I, I had not seen you. So come on up. Um, we will be hearing from uh, Beth Mertz, who's already been gotten a shout out, uh, actually has two papers in the issue. So one will be on the uh, 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 dental medical divide, but also one on, uh, on uh, underrepresented minority dentists. Uh, she is an associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco, with a joint appointment in the Department of Preventive and Restorative Dental Sciences School of Dentistry and in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the School of Nursing. Uh, Marco uh, Vujicic um, is a chief economist and vice president of the Health Policy Institute at the American Dental Association. 
Uh, Jane Koppelman, Research Director for the Pew Charitable Trust Dental Campaign, uh, which supports Pew's efforts to grow the dental workforce and increase access to care. Peter Damiano, Director of the University of Iowa Public Policy Center and Professor in the Department of Preventive and Community Dentistry. Uh, and Anthony Wright, Executive Director of Health Access, the statewide healthcare consumer Advo advocacy coalition that he has led since uh, 2002. Um, we will hear uh, from each of our presenters. As I note, uh, uh, they will uh, draw upon their uh, papers, but I know a number of them have also taken a closer look at uh, California in preparation for today. I've asked them to keep their remarks uh, to seven minutes so that we have enough time to engage with some back and forth. I know Anthony's got a lot of policy to cover, um, and that will also set the stage to, for this session as well as a discussion that's going to follow in the second panel. I'll turn it over now to Beth Marks. All right, how do I advance uh, the, advance. sorry. Oh, right. The big green button. The big this, wait, this, okay. All right, there's two green buttons. The You're just trying to confuse me. Yeah, sorry. Uh, let's the, see. Doing thing. There, there we, we go. go. There'll be a couple more. And one more. That's there we go. That's me. All right, so I have two papers in this issue that I'm going to try to cover in seven minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the first, as we've heard already, uh, is really a historical look at why uh, dentistry is separated from medicine. And I'm just going to cover this very quickly. Um, there, there really is, um, when I took a look at this, there really is a, his, this, the historic separation is on all fronts. So it's through the workforce, the way we educate the workforce, the delivery system is entirely separate, the insurance, both in the design as well as the administration of the insurance for dentistry is separate. Federal and state policy is actually quite different. Uh, scientific discovery and research tends to be separated um, and technology and infrastructure um, are separated as well. So really we have sort of a, a institutional solidification of this separation of medicine and dentistry, um, which is interesting since your mouth, as far as I know, is inside your body. Uh, so what this has meant is that there are a set of externalities that happen. So the cost of doing nothing, of not addressing dental care, doesn't fall to the dental delivery system. Those people end up in the ED using health insurance to get pain control. So there's no downside to the dental system of not doing anything. The same is that if you do something and you make people healthier, the upside doesn't go to the dental system either. So if their chronic disease is managed better, if their periodontal disease is managed and so their diabetes is better, dentistry doesn't get the return on that investment. And so this, these, this historic separation while it's created the, these separate systems, has these large externalities. And so this really brings us to this question of, should we try to integrate or do we try to keep these um, uh, systems separate? The integration promises to improve the patient experience and outcomes through better screening and referral and care coordination, all the things we're trying to do in medicine, really just bringing oral health and bringing dentistry into that. Um, but we don't have any good models, really, of this happening um, in direct health care services, some in the public health realm, but not as much in direct health care services. In, if we keep it separated, then it raises the question of, can we replicate the successes that we've had in the medical side, let's say with mental health parity? Can we replicate that um, using, but keeping the, sep the system separate? Um, and that really raises the issue of the fact that we don't have oral health parity. There is no parity in oral health. We have mental health parity. It's an essential health benefit. It's part of primary care now. Challenges, yes, ways to go, but 30% of the U.S. population still doesn't have dental care coverage. The entire Medicare population doesn't have dental care coverage, and it's on no one's radar. So now we're going to switch uh, on that happy note. Uh, we are going to uh, switch to my second study. Um, and I'm going to come to the same interesting conclusion, um, uh, but, but let's talk about this. So we did a study uh, looking at uh, underrepresented minority dentists in, um, in the dental field. Um, I have my co-author Aubrey here as well. Um, 
As all of you know, the minority populations have greater um, oral disease and poor access to dental care. Um, and it's been many, the Sullivan Commission, the Institute of Medicine, the Surgeon General, uh, many folks are, are focused on why workforce diversity is so important and what we need to be doing about it. Um, when we talk about underrepresented minority dentists, we uh, are looking at black, Hispanic, and American Indian dentists as the, the three groups that we surveyed. I'm not going to go over all this, but needless to say, there are many policies to address diversity, many pipeline programs, many recruitment programs, admissions committee, other types of things. If you think about this, all of this investment over, say, the last 25 years, the cumulative impact of that investment is that we are 53,753 underrepresented minority dentists short of parity. <laughs> you would have to only graduate underrepresented minorities from every dental school in the United States for the next 10 years in order to close that gap. So why does this matter? First of all, we, have, we know that there's very strong uh, provider-patient concordance in terms of um, uh, underrepresented minority providers as well as access to care for those patient populations. It's not the only solution, but it's an important thing that we need to be aware of. Uh, because California is so big, I was actually able to take our national data, uh, not my, me, my co-author Cynthia Whitus, uh, was able to take our national data and actually cut, break it out so you can see the California specific data as well, and that's presented in green. But it's the same trend. Black dentists take care of a disproportionate number of black patients, 35%. Uh, in California, Hispanic dentists take on, uh, care of, on average, 46% of their patients are Hispanic. Um, I don't have the American Indian numbers for California because they were too small. Uh, there's only 372 American Indian uh, dentists in the entire United States. When we look just at the Pacific Census region, which includes California as the majority, but also some other states, you can see this even further. The percentage of dentists, let's just look at Hispanic. 4% of dentists in the Pacific Census region are Hispanic. They are 35% of the population. In the counties where Hispanic dentists practice, they're also about 34% of the population. And Hispanic dentists see, on average, 44% um, Hispanic patients. So they're seeing a concentration, a disproportionate share. We see the same pattern in every census region for every minority group across the country. The ratios are different. Obviously, population levels are different, but you can see that. Then we looked at the counties where minority dentists um, practice compared to the counties where there are no minority dentists practicing. Um, and so URM DDS is that final thing. So you can see on average a statistically significant greater percentage of, of minorities. Um, a little bit uh, higher income, not surprising. Dentists need to practice where people have money. That's, our, that's a structural system that has nothing to do with the providers themselves. Uh, higher number of dentists. Uh, greater level of income inequality, greater level, level of residential segregation, and um, these are California, sorry, these are all California data, um, and you can look in the paper for the national data, much greater level of um, non-English proficient. So you can see that they are working in communities that have need. So, so uh, minority dentists, they, they, uh, this is again California minority providers, um, where, um, uh, service to their own race ethnic group and service to vulnerable populations are factors that influence their initial practice choice. They're also factors that influence their job satisfaction. And yet we know that 84% of minority dentists are working in private practice. That private practice model is structurally unable to function in some of the highest need areas. Um, and so we really have, again, a disconnect where there's a, de a, a, a desire to do certain kind of work and a delivery system that doesn't allow that work to fully manifest itself in a way that we can uh, bridge that divide and really create care for the, uh, for the whole population. So just to conclude, and I know I'm out of time, but I'm going to take one more minute. Um, <laughs> just to conclude. I think uh, the default approach to, to this issue around workforce diversity is just assuming that minority providers will be the minority access solution. Um, this is highly problematic. They are a critical part, but there are structural barriers in place, which is where I started. Remember those structural barriers that are in place for us to really tap into, expand, and use this diversity in our workforce to do more. 
A designed approach is really rooted in social justice. Um, it, the approach to reform of the delivery model with diversity inclusion as a core value that's infused all the way through the system from dental education, financing, and organizational divine. At the end of the day, there, there's a shelf full of reports that talk about why diversity is important, how we can improve diversity, and what the beneficial outcomes are for that workforce diversity. The problem is political will. The problem is not solutions. The problem is an identification of the problem. The problem is, is political will. What is one thing that can get us towards that? I'm going to go right back to where I started in my first study, parity in oral health care policy. We need oral health care to be on parity with physical and mental health, the resources to go into that, and then we can start to address some of these structural problems. Thank you very much. So in the time we've been together this morning, 126 people across America have shown up in a hospital emergency room with dental pain. By my math, it's about one every 15 seconds, according to some research we've done. In California, 20% of low-income adults rate their oral health as poor, as Tim was mentioning problems chewing, speaking, smiling. For high-income adults in California, it's close to zero. And almost one out of three low-income adults in California, almost one out of three, report that the condition of their mouth and teeth adversely affects their ability to interview for a job. So I think what you heard this morning about oral health being part of core wellness, uh, these statistics, I think, put it in perhaps a different context, the way we think about oral health's contribution to social, emotional, and economic well-being. Right? And finally, the number one reason people report that they don't access dental care is cost. And this is true in every single state we've studied. Last year we released a 50-state report. It's true in California. It's true among low-income, middle-income, and high-income adults in California. It's actually true among insured adults in California, as well as uninsured. So I'm Marco Vujicic. I head up the Health Policy Institute, uh, which is a think tank within the American Dental Association. And I'm a PhD economist, and with some co-authors, we wanted to dive a little deeper into this issue of financial barriers to dental care. And specifically, we wanted to ask, well, how severe are they? And how different is dental care from other types of healthcare services? Simple questions, uh, not easy to answer. But let me show you the, the just two charts with our punchline. Um, so what we're graphing here, and this is out of the NHIS, this is the proportion of people that report that they needed a certain type of healthcare service and did not get it because of cost issues. Okay? And what we're comparing is dental care in red and a bunch of other health care services, prescription drugs, eyeglasses, medical care, mental health care. And in this case, we've split it by age group. So a pretty clear conclusion comes out of this chart, right? I mean, dental is leaps and bounds the highest bar in all of these charts, meaning that irrespective of age, the likelihood that you experience cost issues, affordability issues for dental care, is much more severe than for other types of health care services. The second thing is when we compare across age groups, we see that financial barriers are most severe among working age adults. Okay? So when we talk about how the U.S. has approached oral health and health care policy, uh, you heard a bit this morning, right? There's a very different view for children it's compulsory in Medicaid and CHIP. It was part of the essential benefit under the Affordable Care Act. For adults, we do not treat it that way in health policy. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm showing you the implications. The second thing is we said, well, wait a minute. Let's not just look by age. Let's look by the type of health insurance and dental insurance coverage you have. And this was a little bit surprising here. Focus on the second from the left. Um, 
uh, actually the, the far left. If you have both health insurance coverage and dental coverage that is private, that is commercially or employerly provided, uh, quote unquote, we may think of this as kind of good coverage. I'm not saying it certainly is. Um, but even among this group that has private dental insurance, we still see dental care being the highest here, meaning that insurance doesn't change these gradients, which suggests to me that something is not working in the dental insurance model. Why would we take people that have private dental insurance and private medical insurance, and we also see dental as having way bigger financial barriers uh, than medical care prescription drugs? Right? So what can be done? So we've identified issues, we've identified cost, and, and now we're, from my perspective, there are three big buckets of activities we need to start seriously exploring. I'm talking to the health policy folks, the folks like Jay who can actually pull the levers, uh, foundations that want to support innovative work. I love what was said earlier. We cannot just look to different status quos across the country to find solutions. Uh, I was at the World Bank and World Health Organization. I've worked all over the world. I'm comfortable saying we need to do a lot more innovation and experimentation in oral health, both in terms of coverage and delivery. So here's where I think we need to go. Uh, Beth mentioned this. I think we need to seriously reconsider this separation. Um, it's not rocket science. If you finance and deliver care in the way we've done it, you're going to get these results. Um, if we're serious about this, we need to think about better leveraging that, that oral systemic connection, right? If diabetics do better when their oral health issues are managed, which we have pretty strong evidence of now, we didn't have it five years ago, it's very difficult then to patch together different insurance coverage schemes and different div provider systems to kind of leverage that connection. So we need to kind of maybe nudge the systems closer together. I, I, I strongly believe the evidence suggests we need to rethink and redraw dental insurance, both in the public and private space. You'll hear a little bit from Pete later. They tried to do this in Iowa, um, and other states are doing this on the pediatric side in California as well. Um, and we can talk more about that in Q&A. Um, and the third one is the biggest picture one, right? I think we need to start paying for oral health and not checklists of procedures, what's covered, what isn't. Um, you know, we have a pretty Byzantine system of, of dental care financing in this country, in my view. And if we're about getting people to be pain-free when they eat, speak, smile, if we want people, those one out of three low-income adults, to not have barriers to job interviews because of oral health, we need to redesign a system that actually finances the attainment of those outcomes. And that's really different. That's not the current paradigm of here's what's covered, here's what isn't, this procedure on this tooth, and by the way, only up to five, fifteen hundred dollars or whatever. That, that's not a system that, to me, is designed for the future. So thank you. I, I will talk very fast, and I wish I had training as an auctioneer that would help. Oh, can you start the clock again? Um, <laughs> so uh, Marco, Marco was talking about um, cost as uh, a, a huge barrier to uh, access to care for low-income people, and we're, we're focusing on the low-income because we know that they, uh, they bear the burden of oral health disease and they are least likely to access care. I've been asked to uh, um, talk about uh, the article that I co-authored uh, with uh, colleagues uh, Lisa Simon and Kelly Vitsum. We were looking at the delivery system and flaws in the delivery system that are um, major and uh, preventing uh, people from being able to access care. Uh, and uh, in particular, one, uh, one strategy that it seems to be gaining traction in a number of states um, to try and uh, address these delivery system problems. It's called dental therapists and very brief uh, dental therapy 101. Uh, think of them as the physician's assistant analog to uh, the dental world. Um, Basically, they're, uh, uh, some people don't like the term, but they're mid-level providers. They do 
basic uh, preventive and restorative care. What distinguishes them from um, dental hygienists is that they can drill and fill teeth and do non-surgical extraction. So basically, they can stop dental decay. And the reason why this is important is because right now, um, 34 million Americans, low-income Americans, under 200% of the poverty, have untreated dental decay. Um, we know what happens. Uh, it leads to abscesses. Uh, it can lead to, lead to infections, uh, in rare cases, death. Um, uh, untreated dental decay is the number one reason for dental-related uh, um, uh, hospital visits, and yet right now dentists are the only provider in this country that can permanently arrest decay. So. Um, uh, basically, um, dental therapists are, uh, have been used in uh, a number of countries for decades, I think 54 countries. They're kind of a latecomer to the U.S. And what I will briefly summarize in our article is how they're being used in the U.S. Um, a little bit of an update of uh, uh, the research base and what we know about their effectiveness. Um, and a brief look into um, how this provider model may be able to fit into a changing um, healthcare financing and delivery system. Um, so let's take a, a briefly a very closer look at the problems that the dental therapist, uh, that a number of states are, are trying to get the uh, dental therapist to address. We've got a maldistribution of dentists. Um, right now there's a, there's a, 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 a fairly, in, in our little dental world, a large academic argument over the aggregate supply of dentists in this country. Is it enough? Um, the question, uh, I believe, is, is not meaningful. It would be meaningful if dentists were assigned um, to practice locations evenly throughout the U.S., but that's not how things work, and we, we all know that. It's not just dentists. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really every um, health profession. So what we're left with is, is uh, thousands of uh, communities um, around the country that have uh, a shortage of dentists, largely rural, urban, uh, urban areas. The latest federal statistics show that 53 million people are living in these shortage uh, areas. So there's a maldistribution. Um, we, we've got a bona fide su supply shortage for uh, the millions of Americans that depend on Medicaid. There's more than 50, there's more than 70 million Americans on, on uh, or people on Medicaid. 50 million um, depend on uh, Medicaid for uh, their source of, of dental insurance. And um, we know that so few dentists um, will, will treat Medicaid patients. In 2013, the American Dental Association did a survey. They asked, not are you enrolled in Medicaid? They said, are you treating anybody on public uh, insurance? And the answer was, two thirds are not. Um, and, um, and then uh, finally, there's, there's a growing problem. Um, uh, it, there was a talk before about a growing elderly population. We have a dental delivery system that's not nimble. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, large uh, population groups in our, in our country that find it difficult to make it to a dentist's office, the elderly being uh, a growing uh, population. Um, and so we need to find uh, ways that our dental delivery system can bring care into communities like uh, um, the, uh, the uh, Gary Mary West uh, Foundation is talking about the um, senior uh, dental care in a, in a senior center. So what are dental therapists doing um, in the U.S.? Um, Alaska and Minnesota are our laboratories because they're up and running in Alaska. Um, they are using dental therapists to serve rural native Alaskan villages that previously would be visited only a few times a year by a dentist. So what they've done is they've addressed this clustering problem of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, dental uh, manpower by recruiting people from rural communities, training them and returning them returning them to their communities where they have family and, their, and roots and where they want to live. In Minnesota, since 2011, dental therapists have been uh, practicing. What we find is that private practices are using them to serve more Medicaid patients. Um, we know that uh, Medicaid uh, payment rates for dental care are notoriously low throughout the country. What happens when you lower the production costs of delivering care? Uh, there's more of a margin. And so private dentists uh, in, um, in Minnesota are hiring them. They are serving more Medicaid patients, and they find that uh, it's, it's, it is uh, uh, palatable, um, financially palatable. What's happening in, in the public sector in Minnesota? We've, we see that public clinics and federally qualified health centers are using the labor cost savings from dental therapy. They're putting it back into their, back into their budgets and they're serving more people. Um, 
And there are a few, uh, a few large dental operations that are doing some very creative things in Minnesota. They're deploying uh, dental therapists to nursing homes. They're deploying them to Head Start centers. They're de deploying them to um, schools. And, um, and they're, uh, they're, filling, they're, they're filling teeth at these locations. OK, very briefly. Oops. Um, very, very briefly, um, I, I wanted to mention two new things on the research front. Uh, there are uh, two new uh, pieces of research that um, policymakers sh should find quite interesting. Um, we, we, uh, the, the literature to date shows that dental therapists are um, uh, practice safe and effectively. Um, new preliminary findings from uh, a University of Washington study on Alaska DHATs find that the greater exposure villagers have to the dental therapists, the lower the rates of, uh, of adult and child extractions. And I want to briefly talk about one case study that is uh, now uh, coming out of Minnesota of a nursing home, a dental therapist placed in a nursing home. They find that um, the dental therapist within its her scope of practice can do um, can take care of most of the needs of that nursing home, and the dental operation is saving $50,000 a year by deploying a dental therapist instead of a dentist to serve those basic needs. Very, very quickly, take a look at this map. You can re read the article, but we're seeing a number of states um, considering dental therapy, along with Alaska and Minnesota, Maine and Vermont have authorized them. Washington has authorized its use for Native American populations. We've got active, uh, active, active legislation in Arizona, Kansas, Maryland. Um, I'll switch this. Very, very briefly, I just want to talk about what's in the future. Um, we, we don't know what's going to happen with the ACA. We do know that, that health care represents 18% of GDP, and there probably will be continued pressure to bend the cost curve. Um, and there may, may be a continued currency for things like um, value-based purchasing and, and accounting care organizations. In California, you've got one-third of your population on Medicaid. By the way, 25, about 25% of your, of your dentists accept Medicaid. Medicaid is a big purchaser. Uh, we find that um, in, in states where they're putting their Medicaid uh, uh, populations in accountable care organizations and they are attaching utilization targets, um, uh, they, they are starting to uh, see some, some results. And a uh, type of uh, provider that is lower cost and nimble, uh, I would think would be quite attractive in, uh, in an environment like that. Um, the rest, hope you read the article so you can get uh, uh, more of a larger context, but I'll see you by time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. And in many ways, this is bringing me back to my roots because I did my graduate work at UCLA back in the late 1980s. And my first research was on access to care in the Denical program, looking at dentist participation across the state. And that eventually was used in a class action lawsuit, um, not purposely, but it ended up <laughs> being used suing the state. And uh, there was a settlement to try to improve access. So this really kind of goes back to, to where I started in many ways. The green. Big, big green. Big green. So uh, more recently, and I, I want to give um, Health Affairs some credit, because it wasn't just this single issue where they're willing to look at oral health issues. So I'm going to be talking about two article papers that we have done, one back from May of 2015 and one from last month, both having to do with oral health issues. And I also want to mention we were talking about parity within the Public Policy Center, which I direct, and also the Health Policy Research Program, we try to bring parity between the medical research and the dental research. So within our Health Services Research Program, most of what I do is actually medical research, and then we try to bring dental and oral health into that as one aspect of primary care. And so I think that whole idea of separating the mouth and the body, those of us in academics need to also think about how we do that because those things are really important. So Alan at the beginning mentioned that natural experiment that happened in California in 2009. Again, changing access to care for basically three million Californians and losing that adult dental coverage. So a doctoral student of mine at the time, Asta Singhal, um, and her committee of which I was chairing, uh, looked at that to see what the impact of that was. You think about this whole idea of what happens when you lose adult dental coverage. The thing we focused on was that emergency department use, which has obvious cost implications. In Iowa last year, I know that we spent $7 million 
on dental care in emergency departments that's non-definitive. You can imagine scale that up into California, what the costs are there, but also you have quality of care issues, you have health status issues, you have a number of things that are going on, and the main thing is non-definitive. You know, basically they give them antibiotics and pain pills and say, see you later, they still have to get that taken care of somewhere. So that's one of the reasons that's real important. So we use this interrupted time series approach rather than just looking at a pre-post because it gives you a little bit better um, indication of what a policy change is. That's what that dashed line is there. And so if the policy change actually has something to do with it, you would see that disconnect of the line going up right away versus something that might be just a change in the slope of the line, which might be a little bit more gradual. And you can see right there, when you do this regression modeling and you look at those slopes, there was an instant change as a result of that. And so the bottom line was there were about 1,800 more people involved in emergency department visits from the data that we were able to use to do this. So again, the cost implications as well as quality of care implications, and they weren't e evenly distributed across. You had younger adults that were more likely affected than older adults. You had those in metropolitan areas in California that were much more likely to be affected than those in rural areas. And you had underrepresented primor primarily minorities that were affected more likely than non-Hispanic whites. This is showing the non-Hispanic whites graph. That was the one we had in the article. But if you look at it for Hispanic Latinos, you look at it for um, African Americans, uh, the, the graphs are going the, the wrong direction, you could say. So it, it's not only that this is a bad thing, it's affecting the folks that are gonna be most at risk for the issues that you're looking at. Um, then in the article last month, we looked at the best data that were available in terms of what would happen in a second natural experiment, which was the Medicaid expansion going on. Marco mentioned about something going on in Iowa, which we, if there's time and interest, we've had a very interesting uh, healthy behavior incentives model program going in with tiers of services, and we can talk about how that has not worked particularly well, and I think it's important nationally because there's a lot of states looking at that, probably not as much here, but we used the BRFSS data collected by the Census Bureau to look at best we could what was happening to lower income adults as a result of the Medicaid expansion. And then, as been mentioned, adult services in particular have, are, they're optional at the state level. So we've got some states, a handful, that have comprehensive dental services, other ones that basically don't provide anything. So this shows the difference between those in expansion states and non-expansion states, as well as the difference between those that do provide what you might consider comprehensive dental benefits and those that didn't. So overall, many more people were eligible or able to receive dental services, low-income people, in the states that had the expansion and provided dental benefits as a result. But again, they weren't evenly distributed across the population. Um, a lot of the expansion population, as many of you know, were childless adults who previously were not categorically eligible for Medicaid. Um, they may have been low income, but they didn't, they weren't, you know, a parent or they weren't disabled or things that also you had to be to be eligible for Medicaid. And so you had a differential that the childless adults were actually the ones that benefited the most from this. And one thing we did have in Iowa that's probably in this, our ability to look at that's probably true also in California, we were able to look at that previously uninsured population. And those were people that were, you know, their oral health status was much worse than the folks in Medicaid, which is not exactly the gold standard, as you know. Uh, their unmet need was greater, their self-reported oral health status was greater. So there's a huge amount of unmet need in this expansion population, and many of them had not had insurance either ever or for a long period of time. So this type of gain is, is really significant, I think, in the long run. So overall, when you look, think about eliminating those adult dental dental benefits, more ED visits for non-emergent dental problems, um, and these are disprofor disproportionately affecting populations that are gonna be most at risk. Um, more non-emergent dental ED visits also impacts quality of care, oral histemic health, all of the parity issues we've been talking about in ways that obviously go against what we're trying to do. When you think about that expansion, you had a million and a half more low-income adults that received dental care in 2014 versus 2010 prior. The low-income adults in those states with the dental benefits had greater utilization and had greater impact as a result of that. 
the proportion of low-income adults who receive dental care declined in expansion states as a proportion. And this is the part that's kind of interesting, because if you, if you took it at that, it could seem almost like the expansion didn't work. But that's because you have more people in your denominator who are now eligible. So more people got it, but the proportion actually went down. So you get into, OK, why is that? Are there barriers in terms of the amount of services available to people in Medicaid in general in the state? So by increasing the number, there's going to be some sort of a ceiling effect. And how do we work with that, which is an important Medicaid policy issue as you move forward? and the differential effects of these different programs. So, thank you. Those were for questions. Good morning. Um, let me ask again. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just want to make sure you're there. Um, uh, my name is Anthony Wright. I'm the Executive Director of Health Access California. We're the statewide healthcare consumer advocacy co coalition. Um, I do not have a paper in the, in the issue, but my job here is to sort of ground it into what are some of the opportunities to make a difference in some of the things that have been talked about in California healthcare policy. So, um, as was just stated by Peter, uh, the, you know, as our former vice president would, uh, would say, the Affordable Care Act was a big deal for both, the, uh, for, for both medical care but also for dental care. And I, I, we had um, 3.7 million people get uh, covered through the Medicaid expansion that got a, a dental benefit as a result. We, um, and to the extent that California took additional steps, like for example, uh, last year when we covered all children regardless of immigration status, those are folks that um, also uh, got a dental benefit uh, as part of that uh, expansion um, uh, with the Health for All Kids, 190,000 additional children children um, by the last uh, figures. Um, well, we also see it as a platform for taking additional steps. In fact, Mitt Romney and the, 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 his phone call to his do donors after the election in 2012 said that the reason he won was because the, uh, the other party had given gifts to the electorate and he thought that, um, you know what, uh, the, what they'll run on next time is that dental care will be included in Obamacare. Um, it might have been interesting to see what would happen if that in fact was the case. Um, um, maybe there were different results. But in fact, I, I think folks recognize that uh, health care coverage has been seen as a platform which then you can do, put some of the additional benefits like dental care. W w whether it should be or not is another question. And in fact, that is the number one question that I've gotten as an advocate talking about uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, in literally like 100 plus presentations over the last several years, I would say that it, I, could, I could make a lot of money if I said, Within the first two questions of any presentation I gave on Obamacare, one of those questions will be, does this include dental? Um, and because uh, people want to know. And, the, and of course, it's a tough question because the answer is it depends. It depends on your employment status and it depends on what program, what exact program you're in and, and what income level you are. Um, and in California, th th that, that question, the answer to that question has been changing. So employer-based coverage has, imp uh, has improved by putting it at least for pediatric dental in the essential health benefits package in, as was stated and as the research shows, there, we have had an improved Improvement in the Medi-Cal benefit. We eliminated the dental benefit for adults in 2009. We partially restored it in 2013, um, which means that we cover a, a lot of primary and preventative care, but uh, limited on some other things. So, for example, we cover full dentures, but not partial dentures, um, uh, in the in the Dental program. Uh, and so we're taking steps there. And even in covered California, in covered California, we engaged in a, in a back and forth over multiple years at covered California, where in the first year, pediatric dental was, we think actually contrary to the law, a, a separated out uh, a benefit. Uh, uh, the second year, we were able to get it actually embedded into the products that were being sold in covered California. So that means the subsidy would apply to it. And that means that there was a lot more uh, children that had that access to dental care, especially among lower income uh, folks in the Covered California program. And then um, in 2016, last year, we not only was pediatric dental was embedded, but family dental was offered as an, as an additional option. And over 150,000 um, families of the 
uh, over 10% of the overall 1.5 million in covered California took up that option, a premium of 11 to $65 to, uh, to take advantage of a, of a dental benefit. So again, that question is there. Now needless to say, all of this progress is in danger if, uh, if there is efforts to undo the, affo the Affordable Care Act. So what's next? I think the big thing is whether what can we do in dental to fully restore the benefit. There is an ongoing uh, push. Um, uh, it would take $69.5 million uh, on go, uh, uh, general fund to restore, fully restore the benefits in Dentacal. That is something that we're actively advocating for. And then there's also a, a demand on the rates, that there is a identified issue through recent state audits to, uh, with regard to um, the cuts. There have been some restorations in the dental benefit, but it's clear that especially with, the, with some of the issues already talked about in this panel, that there is a need to increase those, increase those rates to, so that more dentists participate and we have better access in the Dentacal program. We think there's a huge opportunity this year. We were very proud to be part of the Prop 56 campaign to pass a tobacco tax, $2, to raise over a billion dollars to um, invest in improvements in Medi-Cal. We have, uh, there is a debate um, going on as we speak about how to use that money. The governor's May Revise has that money to go to pay for, it, for um, uh, cost general cost increases in the Medi-Cal program. We believe that it was both the drafters intended, since we were in the room, but also voters, that that, that money was meant to uh, improve and augment the program in, in, a, in, in specific ways. So, uh, dental was the example I gave at every editorial board meeting that I went to, to promoting the, the, the initiative. So um, it's something that we want to do. This is a, dis uh, and we also want to work on the reimbursement as well. And we think that there is data to, to, to show that a targeted investment in Dentical could make a difference. The, the decision um, on this will literally be made in the next few weeks, if not days. So we want to, uh, so if, if, if you're not, please engage with your state legislators because this is, a, this is a moment where this could get done. It has been prioritized by the legislature before, but ultimately not in the final budget deals. We think that there's an opportunity this year, especially with the opportunity that the Prop 56 dollars provide. The, um, but we also think that it's not just about more money. It also has to be about accountability and how you provide that money. And so uh, a good model is in the Medi-Cal 2020 waiver with the, de the Dental Transformation Initiative, which provides uh, incentive payments if, we, if the dental system actually meets certain uh, goals with regard to public health, whether it's increase, increase of preventative services or increase in continuity of care where children return to a primary source of care over, year over year. Um, and we think that that's a good uh, model and uh, it, it's showing some interesting results. Uh, the, you know, and, and there's these four domains that you can take a look at in, in each of the ways that people get care through Dentical, fee-for-service, managed care delivery systems, or the safety net clinics. The waiver is also chock full of other ways because we have to recognize that there's more uninsured in other uh, uh, in our population and there's the counties, there's efforts to, for example, increase pr primary and preventative care in county safety net programs and other efforts to better integrate health with other services, including dental health. We can talk about more of that in Q&A. Um, the final thing I, d I just want to talk about uh, quickly is just we talk about the issue of integration and one thing that we've also looked at is the value of health co coverage. And there was a recently, uh, we recently helped pass a bill to look at do dental, standalone dental plans, what kind of value do they provide? The, uh, and in fact, we found that the quote unquote medical loss ratio or dental loss ratio, the survey that the Department of Managed Healthcare recently did found that as opposed to medical insurance, dental, uh, dental health insurance has an average of 50% or less loss ratios. And in fact, there are plans out there that have only five or 10% loss ratios, which means that 80 or 90% of the, of the premium is not going to actual dental care. And so the question is, is, is there a way that this can be improved or uh, is, is there something about it that it needs, to be, is there a better efficiency model where in addition to all the other benefits of integration, we can more efficiently use our dollars uh, if it was integrated into a broader medical package. And so lots of policy issues and opportunities just in the next few days, weeks, and months. Thank you. Well, it's a lot to absorb. I want to ask uh, sort of two questions and then uh, I, I want to bring you all in, but there are two broad framing questions I'd like to sort of ask down the line. Um, 
as I said at the outset, you know, there's a lot of attention on the financing, and each of you had financing elements. But um, I'm trying to uh, map that issue onto the, the, the imperative for transformation in care. So we have parity, we have rates, we have coverage through Medi-Cal, we have insurance design. All of these topics have been brought up. How, as you, as you think about a financing response uh, to the gaps in care, do we design any of those things so that they don't just expand access but also promote the quality improvement agenda that you all uh, mentioned as well? So how, how do we bring the financing uh, initiatives to, to not just be about dollars but about care improvement? Who wants to start? Can I? Please. I mean, just to expand on my last bubble there, I mean, to me, that, that's, that is one of probably two or three critical questions on the way forward, Alan. And from my perspective, a big part of it starts with incentivizing outcomes. Yes. However you want to do that, through the benefit design, through the payment models to providers, so that's one thing. There, that, to me, that is, we have to start doing that. We now have ways to measure outcomes differently in terms of how is oral health affecting your life. We didn't have that five years ago, right? I think what California is doing is exactly on that way through the transformation program. That's taking the, fi that's the payment model, right, to providers. But the actual design of the benefit is completely outdated. And unless we get over that and start in paying for outcomes, we're not going to get far. I'd like to ditto on what Marco was saying, and um, at least in theory and, and from what I'm seeing on paper, um, I think that Oregon is a very interesting um, uh, example of uh, progress that can happen when you do incentivize um, uh, the financing system. And uh, we see that um, one of uh, there, there's, I believe, one benchmark for, for dental. They, they folded dental into their accountable care system, so basically they had to lower costs, they had to increase access, and they, had, they were held to certain outcome standards. Dental sealants, um, rate, uh, rates of uh, kids getting dental sealants is one of them. And um, as a result, there are, some, uh, there are some collaborations that are going on with schools that the plans acknowledge we would have never gone into schools. But now we get, you know, a few million dollar uh, benefit um, when, we, when we meet these uh, sealant benchmarks. So we're going into schools. So you really can change behavior with, uh, with, a, with these uh, payment incentives. And California's got some interesting history in this going back to the late 1950s. Some of the first capitated dental plans, if not the very first, was being done in Long Beach with the Longshoremen's Union by Dr. Max Shane, who was also a mentor of mine, for, very fortunate to have gotten to know him. And he basically, they capitated and got X amount per child from the Longshoremen's Union and were able to show that that model worked. They were able to provide great outcomes at this and he became the American Dental Association's literally public enemy number one and was called before the House American Activities Committee as a communist because of his work in this area. It's taken us a long time to start moving back but in some ways that was early value-based purchasing kind of approach. The other thing that's changing right now which might give us a little bit better chance is that there's a lot more organization of dental practices and the beginnings of dental service organizations that are going to be growing with some outcomes that are associated with that. That. And that's, you know, when you've got individual solo private practitioners all over the place, it becomes very difficult to put these kinds of systems in place. Now, it's not moving as rapidly as some would, might have predicted, because many have been predicting this for 20 or 30 years, but it is getting there and probably a little quicker now. But that gives the opportunity to do some of these value-based purchasing arrangements for large groups and be able to have the accountability, the outcome measures, as Marco was talking about, is now there, and other ways to making sure that you do get that. And, and, and just, for, I, I mean, I. I mean, I think it's that a necessary prerequisite is the issue of inclusion and getting people into the system. But once they're a system, I do think, again, I would reiterate this question of we need resources, but you also need accountability to follow, to be uh, tied to those resources. And so whether it's the, de the dental transformation initiative as part of the waiver or whether it's what um, the legislature and the governor may come up with with regard to the Prop 56 dollars, there is an opportunity to use those dollars. That It's a lot easier to do this when you have new money coming into a system than to try to rearrange old money that people are uh, attending 
atta a, a, you know, att attached to. And so there is an opportunity here to do that. Of course, the threat of, of that money going away also puts a, a, a specter on all of this effort uh, with regard to um, the, the, the DC conversation. So we're having two different conversations that are going in opposite directions in California and nationally. And I think just to add one final thing to that is that there, there, you have to think about a, from an infrastructure perspective, the information that you have to hold people accountable. And historically, we really just have used the licensing board and complaints against dentists as a measure of quality. And that's like the worst possible thing you could do. So we actually <laughs> now, sorry, uh, no offense to our licensing board colleagues, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure that we need, the electronic health records, the diagnostic terminology, the user interfaces, the ability to not just interfacing, taking the science, the wonderful science that's coming out of our academic dental institutions, and applying that into evidence-based practice protocols and being able to really design systems around evidence, not just about what we've always done. No evidence for a dental visit every six months. No evidence for that. <laughs> Yet that's what everybody thinks they're supposed to do. So, I mean, once we can actually create this infrastructure, almost we almost need a high-tech act for dental to get the dental systems up to par so that they can actually interact with the medical systems that will then enable that medical dental integration and the return on investment that we've been talking about. The science is there, the diagnostic terminology is there, the codes are there, the infrastructure needs to be developed so that you can truly do that integration. Um, and I think that that's a place where a parity type approach is saying, how do we bring the same thing that we have in medicine to dentistry so that we can create this broader accountable system is gonna be really important. But Beth, that doesn't start, in my view, until you change the financing. I totally agree with you. We have all the pieces there, yeah. but to start kickstarting it, to me, is what, what, what I think Anthony was starting to get to. But so I think we're at yeah. the yeah. necessary but not sufficient, uh, and, and Anthony's comment about everyone in, and that's a lot of what we said in healthcare. You can't organize delivery systems in healthcare with all the fragmentation of coverage and lots of people uninsured and the like. Um, you got enough into my second question that I'm going to see what's in the audience before I ask it, but I'm sure there are people who have questions. Um, I see two back here. We're going to bring microphones to you. I would ask you to identify yourself because we're uh, recording. So as the microphone comes, the gentleman here, and then uh, there was someone a couple of seats away whose hand is now down. Please go. Um, thank you. My name is um, Perfect Munoz, and I was just wondering, as you talk about the expansion and, and developing new access approaches to dental care, what is the, the load on the current providers? And do, have you thought about looking at the, the, uh, the pipeline issue on uh, terms of making sure that they're available, especially in the rural communities? And then what, what do you think about the role of bromitoras or community health workers as part of that teaching uh, method of how do you prevent uh, some of the caries in one of the, especially among children. So um, that's my question. What, what, where do we stand on that? Yeah, I, I think the workforce, my main area of research is in workforce, and it's such, it's such a good question. I mean, there's a healthy debate right now about where we are from a, a supply perspective. My personal opinion is that we have plenty of dentists, and we are going to have a lot more in the future. Um, we're probably going to have an oversupply. Are they going to rural communities? Are they working with underserved communities? That's the structural problem that we have, that they're really not. Um, are, they, are they focused on drilling and filling when we need to do prevention? That's another question. So it's not a warm body problem. It's a total system design problem about how you move those warm bodies into the places and the types of work that you need to be done. There's some great work being done around the promotora models and community health workers. Um, you also see, I mean, historically the profession has been so restrictive on scope of practice, whether it's scope of practice for dental assistants or dental hygienists or new models like the dental therapist. They're so protective of that domain that it's the profession themselves that that's really to fault for not being able to open it up. And there needs to be political and social pressure on that to say, no, we need new models focused on prevention. And yes, restorations are important. Yes, nice smiles are great. Yes, we need to have comprehensive care models. But we need to have a lot more people and a lot, level, lot more diversity top to bottom around how we get that sort of oral health integrated through a workforce that's more nimble all around. Um, so that's my personal opinion. There was uh, two seats over, and then I have one here and one there, and we'll see where we are in time at that point. Yes. yes. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Oh, I wanted a place. 
So hi, good morning everyone. My name is Imelda Plasencia. I'm with the Latino Coalition for Healthy California. Thank you to the panel and for all of your work. Um, so I wanted to share, uh, um, uh, there's a lot of information, definitely, so just, you know, taking a breath and step back because as, you, as you're speaking, you know, a lot of faces and people are coming to mind just as the, um, the, the experiences that we hear from our promotoras, from our community members. Um, one in particular uh, with, with a promotora, she was, um, she, I, I told her, what do you think about health? And she said, well, it's, it's simple. It's es decisión y constancia. It's decision and being consistent. And she said, y no estamos en el punto que hemos decidido. And we're not at a point where people have decided, right, that this is a priority, that health is a priority, that prevention is important. So how do, how do we as a health advocates collectively push that message? Um, because I'm also reflecting about Anthony's comments and at the same time the Proposition 56 money I'm also thinking about like, well, with um, Health for All Young Adults, the expansion of that, we're also, that's also Prop 56 money. Um, uh, Planned Parenthood, the Family Pact, that's also um, uh, Planned Parenthood money. All of these um, that, w that we are advocating for in different spaces. Um, and overall, the messaging is so important, right? Um, uh, Elizabeth, with your work of just, we really need to change the message around really integrating um, dental with medical. That's what's really resonating overall. So how do we collectively push that message um, at different spaces, right? Um, to the comment about, uh, um, Peter's comment about including it in academia. We need studies around it. Um, we need social media around um, just having memes or just um, so being very creative at this moment, um, at really calling for innovation around Marco's point. Um, that the need to be creative and really feeling innovation within Jane's work around um, is there an opportunity for promotoras to learn this skill or to provide basic type of care? So how, how are we also supporting um, this workforce of promotoras, right? Because they are also so in a can I Can I get you to narrow down yes. a question, please? <laughs> um, so all of, all of these that I'd love to continue discussing um, with you about, but just really... Um, really wanting to highlight uh, Elizabeth's work around it being systemic. I feel like um, communities that live this every day have recognized that it's a systemic issue. And so I, it makes me happy that in this space, we are at a point where we're rec recognizing that it's systemic. So how do we push those systemic barriers? And at the same time, have people that are impacted by the issue um, in those conversations, because I feel that um, unless you live it, there may be some blind spots that we hold. Um, so just some suggestions and recommendations for our work moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, here. Hi, my name is Lucy Quachinella. My firm is Multiform Advocacy Solutions, but I'm here today on behalf of MCH Access. Wanted to thank Health Affairs for a really fabulous, informative article. Um, one question, though, that I had in looking at the discussion on the federally qualified health centers is whether you all considered the existing federal mandate. We've all talked a lot, we're all very familiar with the fact that in California we've cut back on adult dental and then only partially restored it. However, it is the federal requirement that at the federally qualified health centers and the rural health centers, um, the full range of adult dental benefits must be provided. Mm -hmm. and. Well, um, we're working with clinics in the Bay Area that are actually using that mandate and the enhanced matching funds um, for the clinic financing to um, get specialty care as well as other basic dental care. So I totally support the big picture advocacy that's absolutely, in my view, where the energy needs to be. We need uh, oral health parity. We need um, the rates. We need to incentivize the systems to do the right thing. But as we're um, trekking that road, all of these things will take time, it seems to us that um, we do ourselves a disservice by not at least considering the fact that the full range of adult dental uh, is available in California through the clinic system under a court ruling and actually under the department's so, uh, uh, requirements. Uh, Jim so, Crawl, so a comment yeah. on that would so be great. Jim Thanks. Crawl, who's on the next panel, actually has a paper that talks about the role of the FQHC. So I'm going to ask him not at this moment to, to <laughs> try to bring that in. Thanks. But I appreciate you bringing up the topic. Uh, we had someone at this end. Thought I saw. Thought I saw him. Yeah, no, right, right back sure. there. 
Hi, my name is Gustavo. Two quick questions. One, as an enrollment counselor for the ACA, how do you tell people what to choose or what to recommend when they ask you, should I go for a PPO or an HMO? And two, as a, as a health educator working, training promotores and promotoras, how can we better educate them and help them understand the concepts about access to care and being able to educate people who don't have insurance that they still can get access to dental care? Great questions. Who wants to tackle? On the first one, I would just simply say that there is a um, in the if you are enrolling folks in Covered California, the, there is there is options for both HMOs and PPOs. The big difference is that the HMOs have a very set range, a set pieces of cost, where PPOs have 20 to 50 percent cost sharing, and we all know that 20 20 percent express percentage of X. If the X is a lot of money, <laughs> then it's still a lot of money. Um, and so, uh, so I think that the, that d generally something that has more fixed cost, somebody who is low income, something that has more fixed costs would be better unless they really need a broader network that, uh, to, to do that. So that's, that's my practical advice. On some of the policy things that have been mentioned, I just want to just say two things. One is, is that on the FQACs, I, I, I absolutely agree with the point that there is uh, care offered um, um, outside of the Medicaid uh, Cal system, for example, through clinics. Um, one of the things that we've been, and through the lots of innovation that's been going on in California with regard to taking next steps. Like for example, you know, Los Angeles perhaps has the biggest program for undocumented uh, residents in the nation. My Health LA, with over 180,000 enrollees uh, in it, and because it's done through the through the clinic system, many of the um, many of those um, enrollees are getting some form of dental care. And again, that makes sense given the research that was described, because if the point of that system was to get people into primary preventative care to prevent e unnecessary ER use later, having dental is a really important piece of that. Um, and then I think on the Prop 56 stuff, I, I would just simply say that you know, when you do raise a billion dollars, there is the room for covering, uh, taking another step with Health for All Young Adults, restoring dental, and still having a majority of the money go for the provider rate increases, that we don't see this as an either or, and that's one of the messages we're trying to convey in the next days and weeks in the legislature. Right. Marco and Peter both wanted to jump in. I think Gustavo's hitting on a much bigger issue here. Thank you for raising that. It's extremely difficult to navigate dental benefits coverage options, be they in the health insurance exchanges like Covered California or through your employer or whatever. So we, we did some work with UPenn that was eye-opening. Uh, they basically observed young adults shopping in the health in the FFM in this case, not a state-based exchange. And the level of illiteracy around dental benefits was eye-opening. And we don't blame anybody for that. It's extremely complicated. But Gustavo, what we did is we simulated out-of-pocket costs for four profiles of patients for all the dental plans offered in the FFM. And we found, surprisingly or maybe not, that it actually was for the vast majority of beneficiaries better to just pay out of pocket and not buy any dental insurance. <laughs> and that gets to what Anthony was showing in terms of the MLRs, right? <laughs> so you're in this kind of catch-22. We know that benefits do nudge more people into care, and yet when you do the hard numbers, which we did months of, it was extremely painstaking, you start to see, wait a minute, what's the real value of this? And we can do better. So it's, it's not a direct answer to your question dealing with a client, right, who wants to do something. It's for the policy folks in the audience. Like, we need to start reinventing this. Right. And it, I wanted to speak to the, the second part of yours and the question earlier about the community health workers, the promotors, and, and others, and that we've been talking about the individual care delivery system for the most part, the workforce issues and, and or the insurance, but we also don't have a public health system in the United States in general, and we don't have one related to oral health. And so you think about that of our total health status, only about 10% of our health status is related to that health care delivery system where we put all this emphasis, where half of it is behavioral. And when you think about oral health and prevention, it's not by going into the dentist 
hygienist or the dental hygienist or the dental therapist where you're going to get the majority of that prevention. It's from water fluoridation. It's from, you know, the <laughs> oral health behavior change, diet, all of those kinds of things. And we don't know, we don't have the system to do that very well. And we don't know how to do behavior change, you know, whether it's for this or, you know, making sure that we all exercise and, and eat right and all those do those kinds of things. That's really the holy grail when you start talking about healthcare costs and healthcare delivery system change. But all of that's critically important if we really do want to move this forward in a substantial way. You know, the dental delivery system, whichever type of provider, whenever there's great, once there's disease and for those people that are higher income and probably aren't going to benefit that much anyways because they're low risk, but when you're really talking about identifying, you know, the child with early childhood caries is going to end up in the hospital operating room, that happens by the time they're three. That's not going to happen in a dental office. That's got to happen whether it's in a WIC clinic or in a physician's office or in some other way or in a public health setting where you're going to be able to reach that child and that mom and help prevent that. So that's the part of all this that we also really need to pay a little bit more attention and thought to, and that's a, a really tough one. So we're going to, uh, in our session after the break, we're going to go a little deeper into the delivery system here in California, but I just want to uh, I can't resist a little observation based on both the questions and the answers. Um, there's, I, I don't want to overstate it, but I think there's surprisingly consistent vision of the need for some changes in financing and delivery, coordination, integration, and that's the good news. It's nice that there's some consistency, not just among the people up here in the front of the room, but I think if you go out more broadly, you would hear a fair amount of that. Um, the challenges were probably, and I'm, I'm, I'm rough here, but we're probably about 20 years behind that thinking in, metal, in medical, where there was also an understanding that we needed to redesign, we needed to bring everyone in, we needed to rethink benefits and metrics and the like. And so you think, wow, if we're that far behind, and look, we still have a long way to go in medical, think about how far <laughs> we have to go in dental. But, but as the optimist that I always am, I also want to say, I think we have an opportunity to learn a great deal from the challenges and successes and failures of that evolution within medical. So for example, the investment in the information technology infrastructure, the investment in quality metrics as defined by patients, the need for alternative financial models both at the patient and at the provider level to support these goals of integration. Medical's been struggling with these for decades. If we can learn some from there, something that took medical 10 or 15 years to figure out, perhaps we can leapfrog a little bit ahead. Uh, so the point is to not just sort of uh, be uh, lament uh, where we are, but to think where do we take lessons. Even the notion of parity, uh, mental health parity, has not been an un, you know an unmitigated success, and yet it's a platform to build upon. So I think uh, my my observation just out of this panel, aside from the tremendous uh, information presented, uh, is that there is a, a surprising amount of consensus around vision, the tremendous opportunities for learning within dental, but also from the healthcare system as a whole. Some of those lessons will come up in uh, the session that we have after the break. But at this point, please join me in thanking these folks for a terrific start. <laughs> Let's take a short break and we'll come back for our second panel. Well, I'll go ahead with the introductions. Um, I, I know he's not far um, and we'll, uh, we'll have plenty of time to bring him in. So our second panel is really going to focus on the safety net uh, for adults in California when it comes to oral health. Uh, we've talked a lot at the system level. Um, and, and sort of macro policy level, this is an opportunity to focus a little bit more on a, a slice of the problem, a big slice and an important one, but to narrow it down a little bit. Uh, we are going to hear from a Paul Glassman, Professor of Dental Practice and Director of Community Oral Health at the Pacific Center for Special Care at the University of the Pacific School of Dentistry. Uh, not a moment too soon, Jim Crawl, Professor and Chair of the Division <laughs> of Public Health and Community Dentistry at the UCLA School of Dentistry and also the Director of the HRSA uh, Maternal and Child Health Bureau Leadership Training in Pediatric Dentistry Program. Uh, Karen Becerra, CEO and Dental Director of the Gary and Mary West Senior Dental Center, you've heard <coughs> reference to that. 
a state-of-the-art facility serving low-income seniors in downtown San Diego, and Laura Marcus, Executive Director of Dientes Community Dental Care, an organization with a mission uh, to create lasting oral health for the underserved children and, adult and adults in Santa Cruz County and neighboring communities. Um, we are, the way we structured this is to go a little bit from uh, the higher level to, to uh, straight into actually what care looks like and what the needs are on the ground. Um, as with the first panel here, we're not so much presenting papers as, as some uh, context, but I'm going to turn it over first uh, to Paul. All right, big green button. Well, great. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, seven minutes, it feels a little bit like speed dating. Not that I've ever actually been in a speed dating session, but uh, we'll see how it works out here. Um, so the, uh, I'm going to start out by stealing uh, shamelessly a slide from Marco, and thank you, Marco, I don't see him at the moment, for um, all the work that the Health Policy Institute at the ADA uh, does. And this slide is one that's often shown. I've been in a lot of presentations and seen Marco, other people show it. It's showing who's getting dental care in the United States by, broken down by age group. Uh, the marker here is an annual dental visit, which is actually a very poor marker of whether people are actually getting all the care that they need and uh, whether they're in good dental health. But at best, we have children with less than 50% of children getting even an annual dental visit, 43% of seniors, and only about 30% of working age adults. When I do the math, I come to the conclusion that the majority of people in the United States are not getting dental care in the current dental care system. Um, I had the pleasure of being on a panel formed by the Institute of Medicine uh, that produced a report in 2011, one of two reports that were produced. This one was on improving access to oral health services for vulnerable and underserved populations. And the thrust of that report was that we have a system that's, according to this data and others, doesn't serve most of the population of the United States. It's been echoed already in the first panel several times that we need to do something pretty different. And some of the principles that came out of that report were what different ought to look like is number one, figuring out a way to bring care to where people are, not to rely on people to go into the expensive and hard to access current surgical suites, which what dental offices are, to be able to, when you're engaging populations in the community, to be emphasizing prevention and early intervention services and trying to keep as many people healthy in the community as you possibly can, and then have linkages to advance services when they're needed and to do all that in a system that emphasizes prevention, early intervention, and trying to lower the cost, basically, of the triple aim. So about 10 years ago, we thought about at our center at the University of Pacific School of Dentistry in San Francisco, how do we go about doing that? And came up with this concept we call a virtual dental home, which we have been testing for about a decade now. And the basic idea is that we have allied dental personnel, dental hygienists, and dental assistants who are going into community sites uh, the whole age spectrum from uh, preschools to schools to um, senior centers to residential facilities for people with disabilities all the way up through nursing homes. So we've interacted with zero-year-olds or practically zero-year-olds all the way up to 100-year-old people in the system doing the things I just said, uh, collecting dental records that a dentist can then review off-site through a store and forward teledentistry system, uh, providing early intervention and preventive services, and then making a linkage to the dentist when more advanced services is needed. And what we have found is that in fact, most people, and we're talking about the lowest income people, the people with the highest rates of disease, the people least likely to get dental care, most people can actually be kept healthy in a community site with the dental hygienist being the only one physically touching them. It's about two thirds of children and about half of, about half of seniors and particularly the complicated seniors in, uh, in nursing homes. So that means that most people actually can be kept healthy in community sites by an allied personnel, uh, dental hygienist in California who are connected to a dentist using a telehealth system. So we started out in 2009 with a proof of concept did a six year demonstration that um, produced some results I'll show you in a minute. That was followed by a number of advocacy groups getting together and introducing legislation, which was passed in 2014, and then regulatory process, as you know, takes a long time. So in the 2015 and 2016, regulations were in place to allow us to do the system now and have it paid for um, through the Denical system. And where we are now is expanding the system, training new providers. We have a, a large implementation about to start through the Dental Transformation Initiative here in California. 
We've got replication projects of this virtual dental home care system that are going in Colorado and in Oregon and Hawaii, and several other states are talking to us about it. There's been about seven or eight states that have actually copied California's legislation and enacted legislation to recognize the ability for dentists and other people who are working on oral health to connect together and communicate and get paid for services that are done using telehealth connected teams. So the conclusions from our initial six year proof of concept demonstration were, we could actually make this thing work. We have the technology and the personnel and know how to make telehealth connected teams work. People can work together in different places and actually collaborate and have a full system of care. That we can actually reach populations who are not traditionally getting access to dental care and emphasize prevention and early intervention procedures for them. We can create what we call a continuous presence, which means that, for example, a dental hygienist in a school is there the entire school year. O often when people do, for example, school-based health care or any community-based health care, it's sort of a parachute in, you're there for a week or two, and then you're gone for the rest of the year. But what we've figured out is that having a continuous presence system where we have someone who's there all year long makes a huge difference in raising everyone's awareness in that Head Start Center, in the school, in the nursing home, about oral health. We have administrators who are starting to go to their own dentists more than they were before and using their dental benefits that they weren't using. Everyone starts to think about it, talk to parents, talk to other people, and I think that's actually the most important thing is to raise awareness and have oral health in the atmosphere of the community site. We found we could also create linkages to advanced services when people needed them so that if someone uh, could be kept, two thirds could be kept healthy by the hygienist in the site, maybe another third needed to get into a dental office, we could actually make that appointment because we're not sending someone to an office with a list here, go find a dentist. It's a much more targeted referral that you're going for this one filling or the one extraction you need. You're back in the community again for ongoing prevention and early intervention services. And we've found that in some of the populations, again, low income populations who are traditionally not getting any care, 85% could get full care. Now that's not 100%, but it's a huge difference from the situation that they were facing before. And that all this can lead to delivering services that are at the prevention, earlier intervention, end of the spectrum uh, at a very low cost and help us move towards the, the triple aim. So um, I think that if you just think in the last minute about uh, some policy implications of, of this system, we are starting to see this idea of using telehealth connected teams spread. I think that 20 years from now, we're gonna look back and everyone's gonna be doing this and people say, well, of course we use telehealth connected teams and of course we go into community, why would we not do that? It's still now we're in a situation where for many people, it's kind of a wild and crazy idea. There's still resistance from it. We don't have a policy environment that supports it. And so I think that's the opportunity we have is to create that policy environment where we create, number one, a recognition of this style of dental care, which is pretty different than the normal dental care delivery system, recognition that that is actually a legitimate way, and in some cases, a superior way of improving the oral health of the population. And that, as you heard a lot of already today, we have a payment system that's gonna recognize the value of what's produced and the oral health that's produced, as opposed to just doing a lot of things for people. So I think those are opportunities moving forward. I don't think this is the only system that's gonna allow us to move towards a triple aim, but I think it's gonna be an important one for the future. So thank you. Um, the big, big one with the arrow. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity, Health Affairs and the Wellness Foundation, uh, to be here today. Um, we actually, uh, colleagues at uh, UCLA and some consultants that we had involved in a First Five LA related project uh, that we uh, have been conducting in LA for about five years now, did have a paper in the December issue, and it, and it was on uh, federally qualified health centers and improving the capacity uh, of those health centers. Uh, so it basically highlighted the potential of FQHCs and community health centers uh, to provide uh, primary care services and oral health services, but we did identify some significant gaps um, in the capacity of those centers as they're currently uh, structured uh, to provide oral health services. Um, and uh, it also then highlighted uh, some of the work that we have done in um, Los Angeles uh, with the first five LA funding, which did focus on young children and pregnant women. However, um, I don't want to leave you with the notion, I know that the, there's a, a broader interest uh, across the age spectrum, um, and I believe that uh, you know both the situation and the policy recommendations uh, literally are the same. Uh, the issues are the same, and what needs to be done, I think, 
think uh, is uh, largely the same. So a quick summary, um, you know, HRSA data shows that in fiscal year 2015, uh, over 24 million Americans got uh, uh, health care in uh, FQHCs or community health centers, 70% uh, below federal poverty level, 91% below 200%, uh, so about one in seven people in poverty in the U.S. actually got their care in uh, FQHCs, our health, our health center supported programs. 49% uh, covered by Medicaid, 9% uh, Medicare, and 24% uninsured. 85% um, of those people got primary health care services, medical, basically medical primary care services. Um, if you look at the dental side, um, despite some substantial increases, in fact really a doubling since 2005 in terms of the amount of services, dental services provided in FQHCs and community health centers, and a 30% increase since 2010, uh, you still have uh, about one in five patients who gets their health care at a community health center getting uh, dental services. So why is that? Um, so uh, we, part of the work, it's reflected in the paper, is some um, uh, effort that I've been uh, uh, undertaking with a colleague, Nadi Parat, who's with the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, and we looked at California data uh, to see what the situation was. And basically, uh, we published this in a brief that uh, is available through the Health Policy Center's uh, website. I left a few copies out at the table, anybody's interested. Um, but basically what we showed um, is that uh, only a third of the health center sites uh, in California have the capacity to provide any dental services on site. Um, there's another about a third that have as a multi-site organization may have a clinic somewhere that has a dental clinic, uh, but uh, you know, a portion of those are uh, within a mile, about 8%, uh, but another 27% is uh, at least a mile and is oftentimes five miles or more. Uh, depending on whether you're in an urban or a rural area, that five miles can uh, be a significant barrier. Um, and, uh, and then there's another third that really had no capacity. So a third do have capacity, a third have absolutely no capacity, and another third uh, it's not right conveniently available at that site. Um, we looked at it by regions uh, throughout California, and you see variability here, quite a bit of variability actually. So in northern and Sierra counties, um, uh, you have only 8% with no capacity directly there. Uh, but by the same token, you only have 50, only 51% that actually have it right on site. Uh, L.A. County, where we're from, uh, has less than a quarter of the uh, actual facilities that have the ability to deliver uh, dental care on site. And this is uh, in a backdrop of a policy, federal policy initiative starting uh, back in the early 2000s um, to when you expand or build new uh, FQHCs, they should have a dental clinic. All right. Uh, so more on that, uh, we've actually just done a, a recent update. Those uh, previous graphs I showed you were based on uh, the Office of uh, Planning uh, here in California, OSHPOD data from 2013. Uh, we just recently did the analysis uh, prior to coming up here for 2015 data. And we have had an increase in the number of facilities. I think most of you know that uh, uh, as a result, uh, through various federal legislation, uh, there is additional funds coming in to uh, expand community health centers. Um, however, uh, although we have more sites, fundamentally uh, the, the distribution of how many of those facilities have dental service, ability to provide dental services or not, hasn't changed. Uh, we got more sites, but we're not increasing the proportion that actually have co-located dental services. All right? Uh, and we did the regional comparisons as well, and there's a little bit of uh, sort of change uh, in, in some of the, at the margins in some areas, uh, but uh, fundamentally still the same situation. So that's, a, as Beth would say, that's a structural problem, right? If you don't even have the ability to provide that care on site uh, where people are coming to get their uh, health, primary health care, you've got a barrier. Right? And one of the reasons why we uh, uh, started in our LA work, we're working only with FQHC sites that actually do have co-located facilities, right? About 20 FQHCs we're now working with currently. Um, and we're, you know, happy to report that we've made some substantial progress even in those places. But when we started out in the first 12 clinics that we started working with, there's 10,000 preschool age kids coming for primary care, actually getting primary care in those 12 clinics, not getting dental care, right? So 
There's work to be done even if you have the structural issues uh, uh, settled and you've got a clinic and you've got people working in the clinic, right? And so that's where the whole quality improvement initiative comes in uh, and as it was uh, iterated, I think, on the uh, uh, first panel. Uh, this is not just going to happen. Right? It has to be redesigned, it has to be re-engineered, and it has to be worked at to find out you know, what needs to be done and to establish this collaboration. Because there's not great animosity between the physicians and the dentists working in these ways. They just don't know each other. They come and park in the same parking lot every day, but they don't even know who they other, their you know, colleagues are, let alone have worked together. So quality improvement collaboratives are a way to make that happen. Uh, and we've you know, gotten some great, we think, great results over the course of the time we've been doing this, uh, doubling and tripling of preventive services and people actually, or young kids and pregnant women getting access to care. Uh, but there's a lot to be done. And the two policy issues that we would highlight here, first of all, the, the structural issue about uh, we think there needs to be a significant initiative to increase that proportion of facilities that actually have co-located services to make it uh, make it convenient. And secondly, then, it's not just going to happen just by building clinics and hiring people. We, we do need some concerted effort and support uh, to teach how to redesign that system and implement it. Um, ultimately, I got one more slide. Uh, this is where I think we're moving toward, or need to be moving toward. There's the recognition now that dental problems really are chronic diseases. Um, and uh, Ed Wagner had the chronic care model some time ago, but people are talking now a lot more about uh, what's called, uh, in Canada at least, an expanded primary care model, where it's not, you know, there's certain things that can get done within a healthcare facility and a system, but more needs to be done to connect those systems to communities and to get up ahead, upstream in the process, the disease process to be able to better manage the actual conditions that need uh, care or treatment. So thank you. Green. Well, thank you very much. Very excited to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to come talk to you all. I did not have an article on the uh, issue of the health fairs, but I am very excited about the opportunity to tell you about what we've been doing in San Diego. I am Karen Becerra. I am the CEO and dental director of the newly created Gary and Mary West Senior Dental Center. I'm going to be talking briefly about what is the state of oral health in California and in the nation, and I'm going to be talking about a particular subset of the population. I'm going to be talking about seniors in need or vulnerable seniors. Uh, we are co-located, I work every single day in a community-based organization that provides meals. It's a senior wellness center. The seniors go there and have access to meals and supportive services. There's about 500 meals served every single day. It's open seven days of the week. It's open the whole year. Um, it's located in downtown San Diego where there are no issues with transportation. And basically, besides the supportive services, now there is a new non-for-profit located on the second floor where we have dental services. Many of the seniors that we have seen have um, lots of issues. We did a survey with about 300 of them. We asked them what was their needs before we started this project and we got to understand many of the problems that you were already mentioning. So I'm not going to go in too much detail but it's a lot of pain, infection. It's a silent epidemic that is affecting them. Many of them are just gotten used to living like that. They have forgotten how to smile. They cannot eat the food. They cannot speak properly. They cannot function. They are living in isolation because they don't feel they can talk to others. Many of them live by them Themselves. So this is another barrier that they have and, and is affecting them. And as you see, in 2030, there's going to be even more of them. And what's going to happen if people are retaining more teeth? And what's going to happen if the workforce doesn't have the capacity that we were talking about? The consequences of poor oral health not only have to do with what I was just saying, pain, infection, gum disease, missing teeth. It's also related to the effect that it has in general health. It's about um, in, uh, in relationships with diabetes, aspiration pneumonia, depression, heart disease, and then new research is coming every single day indicating there is even a stronger correlation. So medical science is advancing and is helping us understand that that divide that exists needs to no longer be there and we're making in some level of progress. But they have some barriers and somehow, as you all have mentioned, uh, oral health has 
forced or has been taking a back seat. And, and that is a big problem because we just cannot afford. There cannot be wellness or well-being when there's no health in your mouth. Um, lack of, ox lack of ac access in problems such as uh, patients describing not being able to afford the care not being able to uh, find a dentist that will accept the type of insurance they have, Medicaid being a very difficult insurance to find providers. I know we have about 25% of providers in California, but the rates that the dental program offers are so low that even a non-for-profit is having a hard time working with them. So that makes it very difficult for providers to be able to provide that service. Um, and like I mentioned, other barriers such as transportation, that's something very important. Even if we find a dentist where they could go, even there's, there's many of them that are not going to have a transportation. They're not going to have the money to take that extra bus to go to that extra appointment and they're not going to show up there. That is going to impact that business owner because that, they, that chair is going to go empty and that person is not going to be able to there and show up as we would have liked. So the reality that I see where I work is that the seniors have to make a hard choice. It's either food or rent. Or when we're talking about medication, dental, and all other things, that tends to take back, uh, go to the back burner because they have to make uh, difficult choices and food and rent are the priorities. So I, it's not difficult to understand that when seven in 10 have no kind of dental insurance. So there was this beautiful center where these seniors are coming and we noticed that the meals were provided, they're very nutritious, very delicious, but guess what? If they, don't, if they don't have teeth, they cannot eat the food. It just doesn't matter. So we had to do something. I was very proud and very um, fortunate to be able to have the support from a foundation and have the support from an organization and a community-based organization that believe in an innovative approach. We are providing care. We're engaging uh, policy makers. We're engaging grant makers. And that is the reason why I'm here today. I provide the care every single day, but I want to come here and tell you exactly what is it that we're doing. We were featuring the New York Times. It must be that we're doing something important. <laughs> the Senior Dental Center uh, has a mission to provide affordable, high-quality oral health with comprehensive education, clinical, and wellness services for seniors in need, enable them to live healthy and productive lives. We provide oral health education in different languages, English, Spanish, Mandarin. We have a cultural competent team that talks to the seniors. And I know you're going to think they're old and they're not going to learn. Well, I have news for you. They are learning. They're asking for more. We are starting to see our first recall visits when they come after six months. And guess what? They're very proud. They, they're asking for more information. Nobody had ever spent the time teaching them what they needed to do. We use the technology. We use intraoral cameras. We show them what is happening in their mouth so that they can understand what exactly is it that we need them to do. We provide them with the education and the resources. They have to do part of the work. I cannot go home with them and brush their teeth or do the other things that they have to do. But we can see that what we're doing is definitely making a difference. We are locate, what we're doing is bringing healthcare to a place that it's trusted, it's well attended, it's a place that it's convenient located. We're removing, the bar we're removing the barrier of affordability and accessibility, and we're making it easier for them to access those services. And I think it's working because guess what? Our no-show rate is 5%. So that is telling us that we're doing something right. These are seniors that were not used to coming with appointments, and guess what? They're showing. They are there all the time. They don't miss their appointment. They, they, this, the, the need is so clear and so neat that it's showing us that we're creating something that is unique. The response has been very uh, overwhelmingly positive, and the need for the seniors is, is, is very clear. We are becoming their dental home, something that they didn't have before. Now they have a place that they can come and they can access those services, so they no longer have to end up in the emergency room with cases like this that I see every single day, abscesses, inflammation, infection. These things are going to end up in the emergency room, and somebody else is going to have to take care of it. And they're not going to be able to solve the problem, and they're going to come back to me. So in the end, how much is it costing us as a system, as a society, when there are so many repeated visits, visits for something that could be so easily solved if it had been done in the right place at the right time with the right resources? I am very passionate. I love what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Uh, we have been open only 241 days. It took, it took a lot of effort to open this community clinic. There's a lot of procedures, licenses, but we have done a lot of uh, great things. We have seen about 3,000 visits, 2,900. We have seen almost 500, 486 patients. And the stories are just coming. 
We are completing treatments, we are seeing the transformations, we are doing a collaboration with different organizations, like-minded organizations like the West Health, where we are trying to collect the rigorous data that policymakers are going to need so that we can show them why is it that what we're doing is going to make a difference. We are also have a policy center in Washington, D.C. that is helping us with, on the policy front. We're trying to engage all the important stakeholders that have a say in this so that we can uniting a movement and make the change that we need to make. Because it's not going to be one solution works for everybody. It's going to have to be a series of solutions working for the needs of the population. I'm talking about, about the population that I deeply care for, vulnerable seniors. In case I didn't mention or in case not all of you are dentists, they are even more vulnerable than children are. They take a lot of medications. There's a lot of side effects with the dry mouth. It's going to make them even more prone to develop a type of decay that is very common in, and in seniors. It's called root decay. So so it's time we start paying attention to this problem because it's going to happen and it's going to hit us and we better be prepared. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, my name is Laura Marcus and I'm the Executive Director of Deantha's Community Dental Care in Santa Cruz County, California. Um, I'm so excited to see a room full of people uh, that care about this issue that I feel so deeply about, um, as I think all the panelists do. So it's just um, an honor to be here and I appreciate your attention today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and history about our organization and how we've increased access to services um, over our 25-year history. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what we have come to conclude might be some ways that we can improve access to health for all Californians. So as I said, Deanthus began 25 years ago as a partnership between our county, of, uh, our county health department and some private dentists who volunteered their time to serve people with HIV and AIDS. It quickly became clear that that population was not the only one in need of affordable dental services, and so we opened our first clinic in um, 1995 with three chairs. We served about 300 people that year um, and steadily grew. Uh, in 2003, purchased and renovated an eight-chair dental clinic. Um, that clinic was expanded by two chairs to eight, um, excuse me, to 10 in 2008. And um, at that time was serving about 6,000 patients with 20,000 dental visits a year. Uh, in 2009, as you all know, uh, that has been spoken about many times today, is that the adult dental benefits were eliminated from Medi-Cal, which had a devastating effect on our organization, cutting our budget by about a third, um, and of course impacting, greatly impacting our adult patient population. Um, we quickly pivoted to serve more children, and that's really what sustained us, but it also meant that we were serving less adults. So our, our adult population went down to about 25% of prior capacity, and our children's population went up significantly um, over those five years. In 2010, we opened a mobile dental program, moving portable equipment into schools, skilled nursing facilities, the WIC program in our community. And um, I'm going to go to the next page. Uh, exciting opportunity came about in about 2012 uh, to partner with our county again um, for community, de community development block grant funding at the state level and we added a pediatric wing to our existing clinic. This um, capacity gave us 15 chairs total at that site, providing about 25,000 annual visits, 50-50 um, split in terms of patient population, children and adults. In 2015, we opened another two clinics, one of them co-located with the County of Santa Cruz Medical Facility, um, both of them dedicated to homeless, uh, one of them a small chair, a small site, just one chair that's operating out of the Homeless Services Center. So indeed, in integrating services, co-locating services really does have a, a great impact, I think, on available care for vulnerable populations. So today, I stand here very proud to say that we're serving almost 10,000 people with uh, 36,000 dental visits this year. We've grown significantly, um, but yet it's not enough. Uh, last year, we commissioned a report, a study by Barbara Avid Associates out of Sacramento. She's here today. Hello, Barbara. Thank you for coming. Um, and that report, 99 pages of it, uh, full of dental data, which I loved, um, and is available on our website, 
um, talked about the utilization rates in our community. The population that's currently insured by Medi-Cal, focused primarily on Medi-Cal population, um, the usage in various age groups, as well as a few different health and other health insurance sources. It's, it surveyed Monterey Bay Dental Society doctors to find out why so few of them were accepting Medi-Cal. And the results were really astounding. So the county of Santa Cruz, like the state of California, has a third of their population, 80,000 people, on Medi-Cal. Of those 80,000 people, only 25,000 accessed dental services in the prior year. That's less than a quarter. That's a third, I should say. Um, and the utilization rate for working age, age adults was about 18%. For seniors, about 24%. That's just horrific. If you think about the population in greatest need, our working age parents and seniors um, with such a low utilization rate, what we found by surveying the Monterey Bay Dental Society doctors was that there's a real um, stigma attached to the medical population in private dentistry, um, fear of high no-show rates, um, behavioral problems, and and other such things, as well as the barrier of um, enrolling in the Dentical program, um, billing through the Dentical program, and of course the dismal uh, reimbursement rates. So um, I would say despite um, despite some success that Deanthus has had, like I said, um, our, our study showed us that there's just so much more still to do with 50,000 people who were not, are not accessing dental services. Um, one of the ways that I'm, one of the things I'd like to suggest that we look at more seriously, and um, I thank you, Jane, for talking about the dental therapists. Um, we, with the, such a low number of private dentists accepting Dentical, um, you know, I have to say it to the CDA, you can't have it both ways. You can't deny uh, providing services to this population and on the other hand, fight this other alternative um, workforce, which would really, yeah, thank you, <laughs> which would really make a difference and has made a difference in our clinic. So one of the things we implemented was a registered dental assistant with extended functions and we have them linked to a general dentist um, for three of our general dentists at our main clinic. And this has increased productivity levels for that general dentist by 50% at less than 50% of the cost of employing another doctor. So I'm very proud of that program. We've just put our third, we just had our third graduate go through and we're supporting them through um, tuition um, reimbursement. And we have another coming through the program this year. But it's a big commitment and we need the support of the dental association to get mid-level providers, um, more mid-level providers out in community clinics. The other thing, um, as I said, is, let's see, here's just a couple more pictures. I didn't do a lot of graphs and charts because I figured you'd see a lot of that earlier. Um, the other thing I think that's really key for the future because of the low reimbursement rates through Dentical, there's a great opportunity to partner with FQHCs, for private dentists to partner with FQHCs as a contracted service provider getting, thank you. I like it. <laughs> I didn't think I'd get claps, thanks. Um, to get reimbursed at the PPS level or close to the PPS level while the FQHC themselves would actually have a small profit. And this is a, a sensible approach to expanding access. There's infrastructure already there. We think all the time about the tens, the dozens of dental offices we have in our community that sent, sit empty the fifth day of the week, but also many hours of the day because they don't have the population that's seeking services. So if there were more partnerships between private dentists and FQHCs, um, there would be a real opportunity, I think, to expand access. Um, I already mentioned the mid-level service providers. And then the last thing, what came out of the study, and I know I'm time's up, one minute. Um, the last thing that came out of the study, which I'm really excited to share, is an oral health strategic plan for our county. And what we did is we gathered leaders from healthcare, but also education, social services, um, government, and we invited them to review the data and look at the recommendations that came from the report and prioritize things that could be spread out, not just us, not just Deanthas as a dental care provider, safety net clinic organization, but throughout the community using avenues that they are already using for education, using um, the pa patient and client populations that they're already serving to expand particularly around prevention. So we've got a first tooth first birthday campaign that's rolling out with first five. We've got um, the application of fluoride at well baby and well child visits that's rolling out in our safety net medical clinics. 
Um, and then we've got a newly mandated at our county level um, through the County Office of Education required K, K and first grade oral health screenings as part of registra registering for first grade, for kindergarten or first grade. This was something that passed at the state level a few years ago, but the funding got pulled to report out on it and it became, it's not mandated anymore, but our county superintendent has made it a priority for them this year. So using those non-traditional avenues, we can't do it all. Dental providers, although someone, I think Beth said, there's going to be more dentists than we need. Well, what good is that if they're not serving the population that's most in need? So that was loud. Um, so I just want to, I want to thank you for being here, for caring. Um, obviously, advocacy, the last piece is advocacy, 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 advocacy. Adult dental must be a mandated coverage in Medicaid and Medicare. It's absolutely essential that this becomes part of what's considered essential benefits. So I hope you'll all um, continue your interest in this topic and fight for the good. Thanks. As I was listening to those presentations, I was uh, struck by uh, Beth's earlier observation that we have a systems problem, and I think I now understand what the definition of a systems problem is. <laughs> so a systems problem is a, is a circumstance where you have to undertake heroic efforts to do what needs to be done. So you're fighting against the system to do what's right as opposed to the system being designed to do what's right. And I think what we heard were some examples of people undertaking heroic efforts, and the policy question is, how do we make it so you don't have to be so heroic uh, to, to deliver the care that people need? So my question uh, to you all in the audience, I don't mean to guide the questions too much, is what, what questions do you have of this group to help figure out how to uh, make that alignment better? And I have some of my own, but I figure I'll get some takers on this. Uh, microphone, sorry. Uh, I prefer you give us 30 seconds to get a mic, 20 seconds to get a microphone to you and then. Alan, you want to do the FQHC question? Yeah, and, uh, that's true. We, we should get the FQHC question in the mix. Yes. Go ahead and talk. And it's on. Just go ahead. Hello? Yep. Okay. So I'm Mary Jane Puffer with the LA Trust for Children's Health. Hi, people. Um, <laughs> but we've been working for about five or six years on a district-wide oral health initiative for LA Unified School District. We just published in the Journal of Public Health Dentistry on the outcomes of trying to establish universal screening of fluoride varnish programs in the schools. And it's been successful, but we find outrageous levels of disease. Five percent of the kids have abscesses in their mouth. Eight thousand kids, four hundred and fifty abscesses. Um, fifty need to see the fifty percent need to see the dentist within one month. So we're trying to figure out how do we like engage. And my friend Gail is here from the Dental Association. So the idea about like marrying dentists to schools to try to reach a hundred percent kindergarten mandate is an approach that we're really strong on now. But we've also tried to engage FQHC partners with private dentists, and that hasn't really worked. And maybe there's, you have some insight from your work, Jim, with the FQs, but, but you know, for some reason, like that little, that policy, how do you get this agreement so that the dental providers would get reimbursed? But what we find from the FQs is also that when they are working on school campuses, they can use their wrap rate. Mm -hmm. So they actually are, were earning income with the screening in fluoride varnish, which is great because that could subsidize the cost of kids who have really high level needs, right? So there's that piece, but the other piece in terms of policy is somewhat of this conversation around promotors, community health workers to do this behavioral change work. Um, with the work inside of the schools, we were able to engage over 220 parents. They became completely involved. We had a tooth fairy convention, over a thousand people attended. There's like a, a very high need for this public education. So policies around community education, wellness, and the contracting. I, I just asked 10 questions. <laughs> Who wants to answer any one of the, any of a number of those? 
Tim. I, I, I'll pick up on the question that came up earlier about the FQHCs. Um, and our paper, uh, the December issue, uh, we actually outline a number of, of broad policy considerations, one of which I think uh, needs a, uh, it, it got about to the two-yard line but didn't get across the goal line, at least near as I can tell from looking at the Internet, uh, and that is to literally have HRSA better define what primary dental care consists of. Yeah. Uh, because that got close, but not quite. And the reason I think that's really important um, is because, um, uh, you know, what is the responsibility? Because the services, uh, at least by my point of view, uh, you have certain capacity, uh, so you do what you can with direct services and look to build your capacity. But uh, back to this issue of contracting, uh, HRSA has done everything it can, I think, uh, to make it very clear that that is an acceptable and it's encouraged to do, but it doesn't happen. Uh, I found one uh, you know, local health center that actually had an arrangement with the dentist and I got the business agreement and whatever. Uh, but there are issues and barriers as to why that doesn't happen. Some relate to income sharing and figuring out what that is. Uh, there are some other issues, uh, but I think defining what that real scope of care is and make sure that everybody understands what that real scope of care is. And the second is I asked a, an administrator of a very large FQHC network down in LA, you know, so why don't you do this? Uh, and her answer to me was, because nobody makes us. Uh, uh, you know, they have IPA networks for certain primary medical care services that they can't provide on site, so they contract and get it done so they can meet their responsibilities. But that doesn't exist. So that's another parity issue or however you want to talk about that. The force is not there uh, to make that happen. And someone else may know or have a different view, I guess. I want to, uh, yes, I, go ahead, I see a question right here. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Clark and um, I hear a lot about education, education, education. Why is it that the dental societies or even the ADA doesn't have a marketing plan for the regular person? I mean like a big marketing plan, not just going after uh, you know, uh, homeless or a marketing plan advertising, telling parents that this is what's going on. If your kids say this, then it might lead to this. I mean there is no such thing. Why? <laughs> Paul. Um, well, a quick answer to that. First of all, there is. The, the uh, ADA in the last couple of years uh, partnered with the Ad Council. It was a multi-million dollar campaign with lots of advertising. And, you know, some of that stuff gets lost in the noise that emanates in our daily you know, deluge of uh, stuff that we're all getting in terms of news. So um, I don't know that there's been actually an evaluation to show how many people saw it or did something different. But that certainly has happened. And there's lots of go see your dentist kinds of campaigns that have been undertaken. I'm not sure that we know that all those kind of things actually have an impact on people changing their minds about their behavior and doing something different. Um, so that's just a quick response to that. I wanted to also respond to something that Mary Jane said about the idea of use the word promotoras and I'll broaden it to care coordination just to highlight the fact that I think we're going to have a very interesting opportunity in the Dental Transformation Initiative in California um, in the next couple of years because the state has now agreed to include in at least the work that we're doing in the virtual dental home testing as a part of that, that uh, part of the money can be used to hire a care coordinator with the community team. So you can have a dental hygienist and a dental assistant that we've been using, but also a care coordinator as a part of that team. And it's one of the conclusions that we've had in doing this work for the last decade. And when you're talking about uh, a community clinical linkages model is the term that Jay Kumar uses for trying to deliver as much service as you can in the community, doing as much as you can to keep people healthy in that side, and then and they need something else, getting them into a, into a dental office, that's pretty different. You face issues that you don't face in a system where people walk into a dental office to get care. And that linkage, that community uh, care coordinator, someone to help make that happen, is a pretty important part of that system. So as we start to move towards population health and focus on that and look at value and beginning to uh, look at all the opportunities to reach people where they are in community sites, the idea of having some kind of care coordination link becomes really critical. So I'm actually excited that we have now a three-year project. We're going to be able to test that and get some data about the value of Promotora care coordinator model and see uh, at least what I believe is that's going to have a big impact in helping us create a full system of care where we're emphasizing care in the community and also tying that to the resources that are available in health centers and dental offices. Yeah, I'd like to actually bring some of the first panel into this 
uh, panel here because there, there was a lot of high level talk about integration and uh, system redesign coordination. And, and now as we talk about it more at a practical level, I, I'm interested in how you all respond, uh, where the emphasis should be, who does the coordination. We, we use terms like co-location and integration coordination. Those are not the same thing. So I, I, it would just be nice to sort of have you extend upon the more uh, conceptual discussion that happened this morning. I I'd see. be happy to speak yeah, to that. Um, so Deanthus has co-located, as I mentioned before, with our county of Santa Cruz at a homeless uh, clinic. And it's really a, a, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, situation because although we are literally in the same building and our reception is looking across at their reception, there's no communication that happens between the two groups. Um, they're very, very separate. And um, we're now exploring a new relationship with another FQHC who doesn't provide dental to act as a contracted service service provider for them and they want to do integration and I don't think I appreciated how different co I knew co-location was you know very very specific around your square footage and, and nothing else but I didn't realize how complex integration would be just talking about the technology requirements um, it, I, it, we almost said, okay, back burner that. Let's start with co-location and let's see if we can move forward. Let's start getting our dental and medical directors like texting each other about, you know, let's try something. Um, I think it's very complicated and especially if it's two separate organizations, um, then it really, there really has to be, I think, effort from the top down in terms of the CEOs getting together and agreeing we're gonna make this happen because it's, it's a lot of hard work, I, I would say. For us, it was hard work as well. We use electronic health records, and we needed to use a, a software, a system that was easy to allow for others to access our information. The seniors come to our center, and their information resides in a virtual place. So it's integrated, but right now, Ours resides only in dental, so there's been a challenge, and we want to move forward that way because we know that that's going to be part of the barrier that we're going to have. Otherwise, we're going to continue living in our own silos, and we're not going to be able to communicate. What is happening right now is we do our hand warm referral. We talk with our care coordinator, senior na care navigator, because we are in the same floor, in the same building, so they come to us. But our ultimate goal is to make it easier so that others don't have to face this barrier. We're doing the hard work so that it's a little easier here also for others. Yeah, Alan, that's exactly our experience, I think, uh, with the first five LA work. Um, uh, again, uh, quality improvement is a, is a mechanism. I mean, there's a lot of science behind uh, that in a lot of application, obviously, through IHI and many other places. Um, but it doesn't just happen. Um, and one of the, uh, another deficit, Beth, you can add to the list is, I mean, the medical people know how to do quality improvement and they've actually, in most of the centers, have got a staff to do it, but guess what? The dental people don't, uh, and they, they're not even considered to be in until you can, so that was the first job, is to get people to be able to speak that quality ensure, quality uh, improvement language, understand what it involves, and bring them together as teams to, to make that care better. So that's absolutely um, essential. Uh, our DTI project in, in LA that uh, just got uh, you know signed off on Monday, uh, is li literally going to look to take what we've been doing in the FQHC world and to try to scale that up, uh, both in the in the safety net sector, uh, that is the physical safety net sector of community health centers and FQHCs, but also to engage the private providers, because that's where we have to go to be able to address uh, the needs of millions of kids in that one county. And I just want to maybe make some remarks to extend this idea of integration. You know, we often talk about uh, integrated services in the health environment of talking about medical services and dental services working better together, or sometimes it's physicians and dentists, or sometimes it's other health workers. But I think the real opportunity to be able to reach dental care and improve the oral health of the 200 million people in our country, my calculations, that are not getting it now, is actually integrating health service, dental services with community organizations. We're talking about, uh, about uh, other kinds of health organizations, educational systems, social service systems. And the, thank you. <laughs> the, uh, the challenge is there, you think we have challenges having physicians and dentists learn how to talk to each other. The challenge is in getting health services and particularly dental services to be able to work, for example, in schools. You know, I have uh, people come to me a lot and say, We're gonna, we, wanna, we like your virtual dental home system, we wanna do a, 
a project, there's a school down the street or down the, or in our community we want to do it, can you, someone has the question, can you send me an equipment list? And of course, my answer is, well, the equipment is like the last thing you should be thinking about. Um, and, and then I ask them, have you worked at the school? Well, we don't really have much experience. And my response to them usually is that, well, don't think that when you drive up, you're going to see the principal and the teachers standing at the corner cheering that the dentists have arrived. <laughs> it, it actually doesn't work that way. It's more the opposite of like, yeah. we've got a lot to do. Go away. Leave us alone. And what do you want? Yeah. And so I think we have a lot of work to do to figure out how do we bring dental services and integrate them from our sort of siloed health environments, whether it's a medical office, a dental clinic working together, but actually get out of those walls and get into the community. That's, I think, where the real opportunity is. Yes. Thank you. Gail Matthew, California Dental Association. I, that's actually a perfect lead into a point of information I'd like to kind of add into this conversation because I haven't really heard anyone talk about that. And that is early on we talked about bringing Dr. Kumar to California. Uh, we have not in California had what I would call a robust, if any, dental public health disease prevention program. And we have now embarked on that with the dental uh, director, Dr. Kumar, coming into the state with the development of a state oral health plan that's in the process of being approved. And now with Prop 56, a dedicated funding stream of $30 million to support dental disease prevention. So for the prevention programs that occur, that infrastructure of how do you prevent disease in the community, reaching all community members, we're about to embark on a new opportunity in California. And I just want to make sure that was part of the conversation here and everyone was aware of that. Thank you. Take one last here, and then I'm going to wrap us up since we're supposed to be at time. Oh, Mike is on its way. Um, I'm Teresa Pablos with DrByCuspid.com, and our uh, audience is primarily general dentists, many of whom work in private practice, some uh, who work in DSOs. And I feel like when we're talking about changing the financial um, and structure of delivering care, they can hear, oh, Big Brother is going to come in and try to change what I'm doing when I'm the one who's seeing patients every day. And I feel like there can be a little bit of a disconnect. Um, so what um, do changes might Dennis see um, through these changes and how can they participate in the conversation if they're interested? I'm going to give you just one response from the work we've been doing about this virtual dental home system and using telehealth connected teams. And where we're beginning to find that there are lots of dentists in California and other states as well where um, they are not participating in the Dental system because of two main reasons. One being that the fees are so low. A dental practice typically has a 65% overhead and they do the calculation where they're going to have, see a patient who's going to pay 35% of what their normal fee would be. That's a money loser. Um, and second of all is a, uh, a reputation somewhat deserved, although I think exaggerated, that people who are lower income don't show up for appointments. Those two things tend to be, add them together and then that's a reason I don't want to be a part of that system. What we're finding is if you can have a different way of organizing dental care, for example, a system where um, you can think of it all as one practice. Part of the team is, say, your dental hygienist and an assistant and maybe a care coordinator They're in the community, in the school, in a Head Start Center, in a senior center that are delivering basic preventive services, collecting diagnostic records that the dentist can review, um, keeping most people healthy in that site. The cost of doing that is much lower. Some of those procedures, diagnostic and preventive services, we've calculated can be delivered at about the third of costs of doing the same thing in a dental office. So if you think about that as changing the idea of what a dental practice is, the dental practice is no longer confined to the four walls of your physical office. You can have part of your team in the community, keeping a lot of people that you wouldn't otherwise be engaged with healthy. Some of those people are coming into the dental office and having some procedures done. We have, there's really, if you're in a community site like a school or a Head Start Center or a residential facility, there's no, there isn't a no-show, right? People don't not show because you're going to where they are. And all of that sort of changes the idea of, now you can have a dental practice where you lower the total cost of overhead. You can actually afford to take care of people who are, have a lower, uh, lower payment mechanism. And it actually is a way that a dental practice can grow and take care of a lot more people without facing some of the barriers that dentists need to face to engage in the system as it is today. And I'll, um, I'll just say it's very much the same question that gets asked about the shift in uh, medical practice and uh, accountability around outcomes and all of these other uh, things that at one level can be seen as uh, interfering with, uh, with historical pa uh, patterns of practice but can also be liberating uh, from some of the frustrations, but it, 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 uh, that's not automatic. Um, I, I, we're, we're at our, our time. I just want to close with uh, three thoughts 
Uh, it's uh, my prerogative, I hope, as the editor, uh, to try to uh, pull this very wide-ranging discussion together. Um, here's what I heard at the very uh, highest level. The first is, we really do need a platform of coverage and financing if we're going to make any progress on the problems that have been identified. The unmet need is so profound. Uh, the barriers to care are so significant, uh, like with medical care, if you have so many people out of the, outside the system or the system is, uh, I, the, the story of shifting resources to kids when you lost adult dental just to keep the doors open was really uh, 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 horrifying but completely understandable. Um, those kinds of shifts make it very difficult to make long-term investments and so a platform of coverage and financing is critical for the resources and stability. Uh, but the second, which I think was very much the theme of the first panel is how you build that flat platform really matters. It's not just, oh, we need the platform. The platform needs to uh, be built around uh, patient uh, definitions of quality, not just on procedures. It needs to uh, look at uh, the integration of, of oral health needs with other needs. It needs to address the workforce uh, limitations that we have and, and misallocation that we have. And so it's not just we need it, it's that we need to design it in a thoughtful way uh, that, that addresses uh, the problems that we have. Which leads me to the third observation, which again was very much emphasized in this uh, panel, which is the translation from the platform to a system really of integrated care and meeting patient needs. That translation is a, it's a hard, it's hard work. It's a long-term endeavor. Uh, there are going to be missteps along the way. Uh, it takes heroes and leaders to make it happen. Um, and only over time, hopefully, as we learn the lessons, as we build uh, easier pathways, can we make it easier for the next cohort. But uh, we, we have got to uh, acknowledge that the translation from these very broad signals at the financing and coverage level to actual delivery of care on the ground is very complicated. People are out there trying to figure out their way uh, and working uh, uh, very hard and against long odds to, to succeed and, and sometimes to fail, but to celebrate those successes. And uh, there, we need a lot of support for that, uh, for, for the platform to translate into the kind of delivery uh, people need. So uh, there's a lot of work to do, but it's really terrific to have been able to engage with you all on both the evidence base uh, from the literature as well as the practical issues you're confronting here in California. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. And again, our thanks to the uh, California Wellness Foundation, the Gary and Mary West Foundation for making the issue and this event possible. Uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>